Good afternoon, good evening. We're back with a guest today, again. Surprise, surprise. How are you, Christos? I am good. Yeah? Apparently too loud. Well. You okay. said it. You're not, you're not too loud now. <laughs> good morning, Aaron. I, How I are feel you? Hey. I, I'm, not, I'm not feeling hurt, uh, heard. Well, now, <laughs> now it's almost too quiet. Oh, I'll, I'll fix was, again. I'll fix it was game. clipping earlier. You were like, you were so loud that my headphones were kind of going a little sideways. So, but now it's too, almost too quiet. So, well, friends, let us know. Can you hear us okay? Can you not hear us again? Yeah. Or so has me. anything happened in the last uh, in the last few days? Any news? News, views, opinions? Anything interesting? I will be honest. I have not had any time to look at anything outside my domain of work because we have some really high priority projects this week. So uh, I'm oblivious to what happened on the world, around the world. I have no idea. If there's been a massive earthquake, I probably would have seen it on Twitter. But I, even there, I don't have enough time to tweet. Well, I started as uh, so I, I just finished uh, Midnight at Chernobyl, the book. Ooh, and, nice. Uh, in keeping with that theme, I don't know why these are interesting, but in keeping with that theme, I started reading about the Fukushima one in, in uh, Japan last night. They had a big earthquake. That's kind of what started the whole thing. It was pretty fascinating, though. I mean, I'm just just getting into it, but it's uh, it's pretty neat. Midnight at Chernobyl. If you ha if you haven't read it, it is fascinating. And the thing is, it looks intimidating because there's not enough gloom in the world, right? Let's let's read some disaster <laughs> books that that can lift up our spirits and make us feel better. <laughs> well, I started re I was started with like Apollo 13, but and then Challenger, and then Columbia, and then now I've gotten into nuclear disasters. I don't know what's going on. Maybe there maybe there's a I'm finding a pattern. Going on. I'm finding a pattern there. Yeah. Maybe it's that those disasters feel better than the disaster that we're all currently living right now. Um, yeah, the last disaster. It's an escape. So, uh, but it is, <laughs> it is pretty fascinating. And it looks intimidating because it says it's like 850 pages. Half of it, literally half, uh -huh. uh, is photos and notes and uh, citations. So it's actually not a, not a long read. So, have, you, was, have you watched Chernobyl on HBO? Oh, yeah. Was really good that was that was fascinating yeah it was uh, scary. i was i was reading it on the kindle and it said i was 49 percent complete with the book <laughs> and it said but we were already in 2016 and i'm thinking i don't <laughs> i don't know what the other second half of this book's going to be if uh if we're already at 2016 and mm -hmm. it turns out it ended about three pages later so anyway it's a good yeah. read though well. i uh, i enjoyed it thoroughly and um i got another one called the ends of the world uh, which I saw a clip. I saw like a, a, an excerpt for him. Mm -hmm. And it's talking about when the meteor came to wipe out the dinosaurs, you know? Okay. And uh, which, I mean, even that's radical because I live in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And there are people that don't believe that. They're like, well, no, I mean, there weren't dinosaurs 4,000 years ago when the earth was created. Obviously. But that's a different, a different story for a different day. I thought you knew um, better, JP. I'll probably be, I'll, they'll probably come after me. Somebody's going to leave a dinosaur in my mailbox or something. But, um, That'd be so apparently cool. when the meteor was coming in, it was so big, right? That it, and it compressed the air in front of, uh, in front of it so much that for, a, for a, an instant, for a split second, the air was hotter than the surface of the sun. And there was so much air pressure that it blew the oceans out of the way and it slammed into uh, essentially the ocean bed that had no water on it because it had all been pushed out of the way by the air pressure. And then the Damn. earth was, and then, you know, it was over. Game, game over. A few, a, few hundred, a few hundred atomic bombs, in effect. Yeah, so, I don't know. It's pretty interesting. But yeah, I guess you're right. It is pretty, uh, that is a Doom pretty gloomy gloom. book selection. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> you got to get hey. in where you fit in. Yeah. Maybe we should change the theme of the day because it started literally down here. <laughs> hey, we're, we're okay, by the way. We don't need help. Please don't say help. We're, we're okay. We're doing good. Uh, I'm, I'm reading. I'm still trying to finish my, my second book from uh, Cory Doctorow. Um, uh, it's all about science fiction, security, privacy. It's, it's actually quite relatable now uh, about losing privacy and uh, state... Um, Agents trying to eavesdrop on their citizens and what have you. Corey, Corey is quite keen on that. So if you don't follow Corey on Twitter and if you haven't read his books, highly recommend it. I just need to find time and not fall asleep after two pages. <laughs> but uh, it's going well. Yeah. And yeah. I look forward to the long weekend. Although, and now you're going to kill me. On Monday, we do have a stream. 
Oh, it's true. Monday's a holiday here. It's uh, MLK Day, which, yeah. given the past, <laughs> given the past <laughs> few months and few years, we should be celebrating even more than we actually are. But uh, we do have somebody, so we will be back on uh, on Monday. Yeah, um, David Paquette is coming, so yeah. uh, it will be just that. We'll do the stream yeah. and then we'll wrap the day. So come and hang out with us, and especially our our non-American friends who don't know what MLK Day is. Um, We'll be around at least in the morning. So, but today, enough about Monday. What's happening today? We've got we've got our friend Aaron from the uh, the Azure, the Azure Advocate crew. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad you could make it. So, what what is it you say uh, you do here? <laughs> um, well, advocacy is a multi multidisciplinary thing. Which has changed a lot uh, last year. Feels like it's still 2020, but la- still technically March. last year. Yeah. Still March. Yeah. yeah. March 300. Still March. Yeah. yeah. So the team that I'm on has always been uh, basically an engineering team. Uh, most of most of my time uh, since I've been on this team has been writing code, mostly Go code. Actually, we're going to talk about that today. Um. And half of the code that I have written on this team has been uh, helping on other teams' projects that are relevant to my area of focus. And the other half has been, uh, uh, what would you call it? Maintaining, I think. Maintaining uh, one or more open source projects that I work on. I, th- I think you're being extremely modest. Some of the code that you guys write <laughs> is making into the cloud foundation, right? And then hundreds, if not you know, th- thousands or hundreds of thousands of people use the software that you guys write. So uh, to put it mildly, you guys are awesome, right? <laughs> yeah, we're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's yeah. one thing to write a line of business app that you know 100 people use in the company, and you know it, it helps productivity. It's a different thing contributing to open source and helping other companies uh, achieve more across the world. So, uh, kudos. Thank you. Yeah, and what, what so happens that the the um, my area of focus and that of uh, the rest of my immediate team. Uh, is open source. So almost all the work we do is on GitHub in the public. Uh, right now, I'm um, my area of focus is cloud native and Kubernetes technologies. And so by extension, that's that means uh, Go, the Go programming language as well, because Go and Kubernetes and cloud native are all really tightly intertwined. So it what is. did you uh, what did you what did you work on before you came to Microsoft? How'd you how'd you end up here? Before I came to Microsoft, I worked on Kubernetes as well. Actually, um, I worked at a small startup that built a few of the foundational technologies um, that are in Kubernetes now, and we actually got acquired by. Uh, Microsoft and we we worked on uh, the AKS team. That's the Azure's hosted Kubernetes service. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we all of us kind of went and worked there, and that was 2017. Now, I believe. Yeah, I think it was 2017. Um, and then from there, we all we worked on that, and then some of us moved around, and I'm one of those people that moved around. Okay, cool. Well, neither of us have really done much, if any, Go. I, uh, I've only done it a couple times myself, and it was to fix like an SDK thing with storage, and so I was having a problem, and so we kind of learned Go together. <laughs> so, nice. um, so, so what are we going to, what you got for us today? What are we going to look at? Well, I thought we could look at some Go. Um, I actually downloaded some code from an example on the Azure site. I nice. will uh, head over to that. So this is a whole big bucket of Go. How many lines is this? A thousand? That is wow. a big bucket. A little <laughs> over a thousand. Twelve hundred. Yeah, so this is um, how to use Azure Cognitive Services 
computer vision APIs. Oh. So okay. we're going to actually delete a lot of this code uh, because it's not, we don't need it. Love uh, it. Which is cool. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we don't need it. Uh, what I want to try to do is hook up to the cognitive services, computer vision, uh, OCR API and try mm -hmm. to read some kind of a document. Ah, uh, my, nice. my dream has always been to, uh, like take all of the mortgage documents for my house, for example, <laughs> and shred them. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's an before dream, I can do that, <laughs> yeah, right. Is it recurring? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all right down there it's in the in the file box there. Uh, but of course, yeah, you need to save that kind of stuff. So um, I w I've always wanted to be able to not only just save it, like scan it on the computer, but also have it be searchable. Um, and that would require getting a scanned PDF into some kind of text-based format. And we're going to build that all today. No, we're probably not going to get all that done today, but um, I want to at least get a start um, to doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to kind of assume, yes, we have a PNG or a PDF or, or something that is an image. And uh, from that point on, we can take that image and send it up to cognitive services. And if all goes well, then we can get back some amount of data on what the actual text is inside of that image, courtesy of Azure Very doing nice. all the hard work. And if we get to it, um, right here, you can see this line is looking up an environment variable. Mm -hmm. And it's called computer vision subscription key. Yes. So this is using, of course, a subscription key. Hey, Aaron, and... can you do a click uh, one zoom? Or maybe oh, two? yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. It's fine because some people don't really maximize the window, so it looks sure. a little bit smaller on the smaller window. How is that? Better? That's, Robert that's Wilson? better. That's much better. I think that looks yep. better, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. <clears throat> yeah, so, and just to throw some more work on the pile, um, this is looking up that environment variable and what I wanted to try to do is uh, switch this over from using the subscription key based authorization and authentication to using MSAL. Nice. Um, so instead of using the key to authenticate to the OCR service, we're using Azure AD to authenticate and use the service, correct? Yep. Nice. So, so yeah, identity oh, is everywhere. Identity is everywhere. And we have to use it here because um, Azure needs to know how to charge me money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's interesting that you say that because at some point, and I think it's still valid, there, there is an option to run a lot of these cognitive services in a container. And I don't know if you're going to do that today. And it was it was interesting because everybody's like, "Oh, I can run this locally, which is great." But how does the uh, the charge model works like how, how am I going to be paying for it or how am I getting charged? And you still need to actually include a, I think you need to include a key and a subscription somewhere in order for the container to be able to operate and charge you for that. But the fact that you can run it locally and everywhere, it's uh, pretty crazy. I hadn't I didn't know that. That's oh, you pretty didn't know cool. that? No. I'll, 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 I'll add a link. I think we did a demo uh, on, on .NET a few, uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago on that. Yeah. Let me find it. Yeah, I had no idea that I, I do a lot with containers. That's one of my sort of areas of focus at work. Going so that's pretty Docker. cool. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll find the links and I put them over there. So uh, <clears throat> it's actually very, very well supported and it scales Sweet. fantastically. Sweet. On the chat. On Going the chat. out. There we go. Oh, oh wow. It's this. Agner, Azure, Agner. Azure Cognitive Services Containers. Yeah. Cool. Oh, cool. It's, uh, it's amazing. Very cool. It doesn't support all the services for now, but uh, the team is just open to feedback. So it's, let's say if you want to run a uh, uh, translation on the fly in a container, then submit a request and they will make it happen. Hmm. Computer vision, special analytics, face, and there you go. 
Cool. Yeah. So um, we're going to just use straight up Go binaries and not containers for mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. That would have been cool if we did. But <laughs> well, well, for the for the next stream, you next never know. One. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, Go containers are are a cool technology to me at least because, like you said, you can run uh, anything that can run in a container can run anywhere that supports containers, and a lot of places support containers. Servers, my machine, laptops, Raspberry Pis everywhere. So that's pretty cool uh, that you know Azure took all of their proprietary stuff and shoved it into a container for me to use on my tower here mm -hmm. in the in the basement office. And, Are they disconnected? Um, like, I mean, because <clears throat> I remember there was a, at, at one point. I haven't used Cognitive Services in a while, but uh, at one point, you know, it was. Uh, you could run them on like Azure IoT Edge and stuff, and so if you were offline sometimes, you know, you'd have this local, <clears throat> you know, you'd have these services available locally, and then, mm -hmm. you know, when you would occasionally connect a cruise ship, an oil rig, a you know something in the middle of nowhere with bad internet connectivity, like my in-laws house, like places like that. I I think the requirement is that you need to be able to connect to the internet so you can. Uh, you can be charged, but it, I could be wrong. I mean, it's been over a year and a half since uh, I've looked into this one. Well, let's so, see. Can we go into computer vision? That's what I wanted to use. Prereqs, request approval, fill out a request wow. form. Yeah, you need to sign up for the program, I think. And then there's an endpoint that you have to hit. And then there's some keys you pass in, so. Nice. I assume, I assume that this hits the the Azure server somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Billing yeah. endpoint. There you go. And so it could also doctor, be kind of like what, yeah. uh, like how Azure Stack works, right? Where you've got a connected yeah. mode where you're paying as you use it, and then you've got a non, an un, a disconnected mode, unconnected, a disconnected mode where you're essentially paying for what you could do with it at most. <laughs> yeah. Ah. And yeah. it's up okay. to you to fill it up. Yeah. So, oh yeah. right, so you get a quota, and then whether you fill it or not, it's totally down to you. Yeah, because it's disconnected, so it can't meter yes. back, right? So it's like, well, it's cool. You can use this whole rack if you pay us essentially the full capacity of said mm -hmm. rack. So mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. For the go part, I started talking about you know the benefits of containers because um, you know containers are very portable. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, but bare Go binaries are also fairly portable as well. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I got into Go and stuck with it. Uh, it's a pretty simple distribution model, whereas a Java app or a .NET app, they are also very portable, but you've got to ship the runtime with it as well. And Go just is a binary. And I think that's... Um, it has higher level features like .NET or Java might have, but um, it do it doesn't have to, you know, sit around next to this big runtime environment. Um, instead, you get a self-contained binary with all the runtime built into it, and that has like the similar cool properties to containers that I really dig. Nice. So we're gonna see that today. Uh, yeah, I'm going gonna... to say to admit that I've never really touched Go anywhere. Like, I don't even know how to write a single line of Go. Uh, That's so cool. today we'll all be learning Go. Yeah, I'm happy. I, I do a lot of teaching of Go, so I'm happy <laughs> to provide a lesson today. So, yeah, well, that's a lot um, that I wanted to do. Um, this is going to be a command line app, so we'll see a little bit about how to build command line apps with Go. Yeah, let's wire it up. Yeah, let's do it. So I've got it... Uh, I'll put a link to the show. I'm not, sorry, not the show. To the code. Um, it's open source. So I've got this opened in VS Code. Mm -hmm. And we have it here. This is the same code that I showed on GitHub. So there's a ton here. Um, and also, I haven't set up my cognitive services project yet. So we're going to have to go into the Azure portal and do that as well. Um, but 
if I go down, this is kind of where the magic happens here. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is in a Go program, any Go program, everything starts with this main. So this mm -hmm. means the main function. Every function starts with func. Mm -hmm. And then we've got main here. And then squiggly braces around the whole body of the function. So do you get the classes? Similar. I mean, it's it's a little bit weird that everything is in one file. Is it easy to segregate? Is it standard practice for Go to have everything in one file? Oh, yeah, it's certainly easy to split up. We're actually going to okay. do some of that because I, I can't deal with 1200. <laughs> I'm sure most of you, I'm sure you both and most of our viewers can't deal with 1400 actually. Wow. Not 12. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to do that. Sure. Um, but yeah, I wanted to just start with the, the basic. Mm -hmm. So if you're a .NET developer, well, if you're a C Sharp developer or a Java, C++, C, stuff like that, yep. um, you'll probably be familiar with you know the block formatting with braces and how to write a function. You know, func is a new keyword, but it's kind of similar. You've got the main function. It doesn't return a value. And your Go program will always start here from the top of the main function. So then, just to do a tiny little bit more sort of learning about Go, this syntax right here is both uh, declaring and assigning a variable. So faces okay. image path is a variable. Colon equals is a new syntax for a f quite a few people. And this is saying the value of faces image path is this string resource faces dot JPEG. And go is going to automatically infer that it is a string type. Um, uh, that's so important. Is, is it automatically types. inference or can you also hard code the, the, the parameter type? Yep. You can do that too. Okay. Um, you can do this, uh, this syntax faces image path string equals resources faces dot jpeg and this is a different syntax but does the same thing mm -hmm. most people don't do this um, because goes inference is pretty good so they just stick with this but a good rule of thumb is that when you've got the colon equals that means typed equals or inference okay. equals sure Yep. Whereas this one, obviously, is just, just equals only. Cool. <clears throat> so that's what we've got going on there. We've got some more strings. Now, the last thing, the last two things that I'll mention are uh, environment variables and if statements. So okay. environment variables, fairly simple. You've got this function call os.getenv, pass it the name of the environment variable, and then it'll either give you back the value or an empty string in this variable here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we've got our if. And we're going to check, is it an empty string? Yep. So if also similar to C or Java or whatever, the only difference is you don't need to put in parentheses. You can, but you don't need to. So what this is saying is if you didn't pass it, it's going to be empty. If it's empty, do a log and then exit with exit code one on unix mm, nice so there's a ton more but we'll kind of hit that as we go uh so we'll does it run Th that's a good question uh, <laughs> let's see if it even builds Will it build? that's a good point hey it builds okay so that's how you'd build the thing now it's in it's in a new binary right uh, and it's going to be called MSAL425. So are you, on a, are you on a Windows or a Mac? You're on a Mac. No, I'm on uh, Ubuntu right oh, now. Oh, Ubuntu. Yeah. Nice. Unix. And this is using the Tmux terminal multiplexer. Uh, so it'll, it's got nice pretty colors. Maybe, is that, maybe you thought I was on a Mac because of the color. <laughs> <laughs> I like the coloring. That's why, that's why I was asking. Yeah. Thank nice. you. Yeah. This is actually Pop OS, the System76. Uh, those folks have a distro of Ubuntu. They put a lot of stuff on top of it. Mm -hmm. So it's nice for the desktop. I, I enjoy it. So you're, you're full Linux end-to-end? 
end to end, no Mac in sight, no Windows in sight. <laughs> and and with regards to Microsoft, uh, there are some systems that you I think you have to use Windows, like expenses. How do you uh, go around that? Do you have a VM? No, um, expenses, it, there is an online portal for expenses internally. Um, is but it I, not something that was written in like 1998? It is, hey, yeah. It works. <laughs> yeah, I, it works. I, I've seen yeah. that one. Yeah it's, yeah, it's my backup plan when my main uh, Windows app doesn't work. Okay, Yeah. sorry for, sorry for sidetracking you, but... No, no, it's, it's like, okay. Because my, my Mac can get me like 95% there. They're like 5% of things I have to do. At max that the, the Mac can do it, but yeah, okay, nice. Yeah, I mean, m- my my work is heavily dependent on Linux, right? Um, especially with the containerization stuff. Mm-hmm. Go Go is com- cross platform. It yes. has uh, the same support for Windows as Linux or Mac, but the container and Kubernetes stuff, you can do all of it on. It's actually easier to do Kubernetes things on Windows because you've got WSL2 and that's Mm -hmm. a Linux kernel. Um, But really, if you're on Linux, you're going to save yourself some time when you're doing stuff over in that realm. Okay. I've been doing Linux. I've been running Linux for years uh, in some way, shape, or form. So I, I actually built this tower a while ago and I figured... I'll try. I I tried out Windows and mm-hmm. uh, WSL for a while, um, and it wasn't too bad actually in terms of my development workflow. Mm-hmm. Um, but eventually, I kind of cracked and just said, you know, there's <laughs> going to be so much less, uh, so much less um, barriers to getting Kubernetes work done that I just made the made the jump. No, that's fine. Never been brave enough to just make it my uh, main OS. Always been using VMs here or there. Try it sometime. It's not uh, not as not as bad as you might think. I'm not as good at uh, on the command line as you are. That's the challenge. That can be fixed too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure it can be fixed. But do I have enough time? That's the question. Do yeah. I have enough time to do that? <laughs> yeah, it's, that's totally fair. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's see if it runs. I don't think it's going to run. I actually think it's going to hit one of those long dot fails here. It's going to crash it, but let's see. There you go. Set a subscription key. All right, this is the thing we were trying to get rid of. So let's write some code and try to organize this code base and then start getting rid of the the key in, in favor of doing MSAL. Does that sound like a plan? Yay or nay? What are you, okay. Sounds like a good one to me. All right. Coolio. So, yeah, let's split this thing up into different files. So, let's make a file here called auth. And we're going to do our auth related things in here. Uh, so, the structure of a Go file. It always has a package at the top. And then after you write, literally write package and you put a space, you name the package you're in. So packages don't follow the name of the directory necessarily, um, but you do always start with the main package, no matter what directory you're in. So I'm in like a directory called MSAL go blah, 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 but we're still calling it package main. Is it is it kind of like a namespace, like that all these things are related, or okay? Yeah, yeah. So if I I can do a subfolder and I can do you know blah, and then have a file in there called my file whatever my file dot go, and I can call this package foo. But if I put another file in there, my other file, I have to have package foo in here. I can't call oh, this package bar. Oh, okay. So, so then the, root, the last piece... The root folder, it's cool, but in subfolders, they all have to match? They still <laughs> actually have to all match in the root folder, too. Oh, okay, okay. That makes sense. All right. So in the root folder, if I'm building a binary, 
and not like a third party library. I've got to have this be called package made. And then everything okay. else in that root folder are going to be the same. But also another cool thing, this is um, a constraint, but I also kind of think it's cool in a way too. Your package names are always based on the, uh, well, almost always based on the fully qualified name of your project. So I've named this project after the GitHub repository. So it's whatever, msal go 425 show. So that right there is the root. That's the fully qualified name of my project. So then if I want to start doing stuff with the code I've written in this blah directory, then I would do that. Okay. And then from that point on, now I can do blah dot, you know, function one or blah dot function two, whatever. You know, I can go on and on with that kind of stuff. Oh, and that's actually called foo, so I would have to do this. Foo, not blah. So, then one last thing about this, and I'll keep going and going, so I'll try to stop myself, but I love teaching this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's cool, great. Keep on going. Yeah. So, um, another thing in this, the, the visibility or how to do private variables and private functions and stuff, in Go is uh, pretty different than anything I've ever seen in my life. Um, there's no private or public variable. Um, well, there's no private and public key. Sorry, keyword. I can't find the words this morning. <laughs> so there's no keyword in Go call that, that's like private or public. So if I want to go in here and I want to make a private function. No encapsulation, in other words, or? There actually is. is encapsulation, but in the form of a func. Um, no, so I can do like a func or a var, mm -hmm. uh, or a constant, and these are all already private. All everything I've written in this file is private. So if uh -huh. I want to do something public, uh huh. That's how you make a public function. So the only way to do it is if it starts with an uppercase Unicode character, <laughs> it's public. That's it. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's really um, like on the face of it, it's, it seems too simple, right? To me, to me, it did when I started. I remember thinking, like, I would rather just do like that, maybe, or something. Um, but it, it actually works pretty handily, uh, to me, at least. Mm -hmm. Because when you're going in here, and, well, let's actually start back here. When you're in here, there's less to read and write. So you don't have to write public or private. Um, but then also when you go into here, you can see without even looking at this, without even looking at the food part, you can see, oh, there's an uppercase here. I'm probably calling something from a different package. Yeah. I mean, so, it's funny cause the naming, like kind of the naming standards and the way people name things, it sort of maps to that anyway. Right. Like yeah. most of my private fields and variables in like a C sharp class are going to be lowercase or even underscore lowercase and most of my public fields or <clears throat> public properties are going to be uppercase so that's uh yeah. it's pretty it's pretty neat i mean it's it seems completely undiscoverable until somebody tells you but then it <laughs> kind of once it spins the drain you're like actually wait a minute that's a pretty uh that's a pretty neat idea so that's uh, pretty cool yeah and i guess the same is true for <clears throat> uh for like variables and constants too right if i wanted to make yep. one public okay cool we have we have a question yeah. Uh, Jet77 is asking, so my private func, my private func would be public, but my private func with lowercase m would be private? Yeah. Much, right? Yeah. Ooh, so I can make it. Interesting. Now we're. Yeah, don't now do we're, that. <laughs> <laughs> now we're really, really on the edge. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, this this is public. Not confusing at all, especially the fact that you use the my private, uh, yeah. private in there. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So you, yeah. you mentioned C sharp. Another confusing thing would be um, like another confusing analog to this would be in Python because uh, mm -hmm. you know they have the Python doesn't really have private. It has the underscore where yes. it will like yeah. mangle the name at runtime. So <laughs> you know yeah. that's a. I would say I've done a lot of Python in my in my day. As the old man that I am in <laughs> my back day, in the good old days. <laughs> yeah. So in my day, I've done a lot of Python, and I've found this to be a little less confusing than Python's underscore public private thing that they've got going on. Um, just because the names are the names here, and in the Python world, if you do the underscore, some magic happens at runtime, and I don't know what it is. So, you know, you've got your pros and cons. Yeah, absolutely. So this this namespacing, uh, well, this this visibility mechanism, it even permeates over to documentation and th things like that as well. So it's it's really it's really fundamental. It's really core to the language, and that's you know something to keep in mind because um, it's you know it's literally everywhere. You may even see it today. Mm -hmm. But I am going to blow away this directory because we're not yet going to need um, a sub package. Sure. So, you know, I've, I've notated this as package. So we're not going to need the sub package. We will need different files, but they're all going to be inside the same directory and thus inside of the same package. So do we need to go and set up our cognitive services now? Is that the next step? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And, and for those that don't know, Cognitive Services is a service on Azure that allows you to do, it's almost like machine learning on the fly, right? Where you can do some amazing things uh, using off-the-self functionality. So you don't have to go and train your models, for example, example. Or at least you have to do a little bit of training, but there's an underlying base on the, uh, on the training. So let's say if you want to do image recognition and you want to... Uh, Test whether something is a hot dog or not, right? Or something else. I think one of the uh, somebody, uh, Doctor G, one of Microsoft developers, she was doing um, space rock recognition uh, using uh, public images from the NASA uh, space station using cognitive services, which was amazing. I was mind blown. So Very she was using the the basis of cognitive services, and that means that um, the cognitive services service comes with a large number of. Um, image analysis and then on top of that you provide a very small sample that is optimized for your needs so let's say minimum of 20 images I think for image recognition and uh, that's all you need to do rather than training thousands upon thousands of um, models on on a large data set and it's brilliant you just go you say what kind of service you want to use as uh, Aaron has just done here and then um, you get a key and you can call that uh, service. I think for OCR, you don't even even need to do anything as in training. Just point to a URL, pass some image, and then we'll try to uh, retrieve the text for you. Yeah. Yeah, and there's there are other sort of pre-canned um, AI services on here where it's general enough that you don't have to do any custom training. Yes. A lot of the computer vision stuff, like you said, is is that. So then I go like I go create computer vision. And while Aaron is doing that, um, I, I worked on a similar project. Some of you may have seen me do it, presenting that with uh, Scott Hansman on stage, but we use cognitive services to um, recognize text and logos from other services uh, on a mobile app that would allow you to you know draw something on the whiteboard or put some stickers there, and then. Uh, you would take that information, analyze it, and then go and deploy those resources on Azure. So you would snap a picture with your phone. Uh, it will call a couple of cognitive services. It will get the data back, and it would identify that you want a VM, a web app, uh, maybe a couple of Azure functions. And then we'll walk you through the process of deploying these onto <coughs> Azure. So you went from whiteboard to Azure in a few minutes. So if you are an architect working with customers, for example, you could go and whiteboard their infrastructure or their solution and then deploy it on Azure just to show them how it would look like, which was, you know, it doesn't take a, a nuclear scientist to, <laughs> to do these things. No. Yeah. You don't have to be intimidated by AI. 
Exactly. I, I like it because I, I, I am intim- intimidated by AI, and uh, <laughs> you know you can you can dip your toes in the water with this because there's you don't have to know anything about AI with it. Yes, and machine learning. Like there's a lot of uh, mathematics that go behind the scenes or understanding different models uh, yeah. that the complexity is too much for my common brain to comprehend. So I have yeah. some really clever people that did all that, that packaged it for you, and they made it a uh, software as a service, if you want to call it like that. And all you have to do is just pass some data and yeah. an endpoint uh, in your code, and it works. And there are SDKs as well. I don't know if we're, if we're going to be using the SDK day, are we? Or are we doing yeah. HTTP calls? Yeah, we are down here. Uh-huh. I just go to one of these functions. There is, right here, this is part of the SDK. So the the base client of it is actually mm-hmm. called base client okay. <laughs> computer vision <dot> base client <laughs> this is a third party okay. uh, this is not something built into my code it, you yes can, if we head up here this is code from the interwebs that azure has built this yes azure from the SDK azure sdk so. team which are doing a fantastic job and they have a go uh, version of the azure sdks which i think yeah. we're using here Brilliant. yeah absolutely yeah so i am going to start out getting keys and endpoints so i'm not going to click show keys <laughs> on stream <laughs> do not dox yourself just no, uh, hide not. the screen for a while yeah um but this is like i'm going to get us started with the subscription keys and then i'm going to try to get something working and then switch us over to using msal does that sound like an okay plan yes perfect cool all right I'm going to move this to a different screen here. Da-da-da. So we can copy our endpoint into there. And then we don't have to set that environment variable. But for the key, I'm just going to set that up. You have a mechanical keyboard I can hear. Oh, which, yeah. which one are you using? Um, this is a... This is a Frankenstein. Um, How <laughs> you build it yourself? Sort of. It's a DOS <laughs> keyboard. Nice. Um, but it's got a bunch of different key switches and keycaps on it as well. Are you uh, red, brown, blue? Um, I'm Cherry MX Brown. Hmm. That's what nice. I'm rocking today. So. Um, Let's just run it mm-hmm. now and see what happens. So yes. I've got to go build and go. Uh, I've got to go build and run the binary again. There's a shortcut to that handily. So go run. Does what it says it's going to do. Okay, we got further. Uh, Very nice. No dot jpeg. No yeah, I was going to say we were probably referencing resource uh, directories that don't exist yet. Yeah. So. I'm going to go back to where I got the example code, which mm-hmm. is there. And I think that they have maybe some PNG files somewhere. Maybe they might not have that. included them into the repo. Oh, OK. Well, we can grab some from the uh, from in the interwebs, right? Yeah. Being faces and put a couple of faces there. Or we're let's, doing OCR, right? So. Yeah, let's try. Um, Sample documents. I don't know. In support of the new constitution. Okay. <laughs> sure. Ah, nope. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> not gonna not gonna use that one. <laughs> no. Multi page sample document. There's a PNG. Alright. So we're going to save the image. Let's put it on a desktop for now. And we're going to copy it in to us. All 
All right, so let's go. Uh, where did we have all of these things? I think at the same time, we're going to start pruning this code and just use the OCR stuff. Describe, yep, yep, yep. Blah, blah, blah. what are we looking for here? Calurize tag. I think this one is doing quite a few things, right? So it's not just doing OCR, it's doing other uh, yep. image recognitions as well. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. So it looks like everything here mm -hmm. is not what we want. Okay. We don't want to detect brands or categorize image or tag images or generate thumbnails. We want to do this, not this either. We want to do one of these, recognize printed OCR local or remote. I didn't know you could do remote. So I don't even think we needed to download this document. Oh, that's amazing. That's yeah. changed. I don't think that was available before. So that's probably new API uh, capability. I love it. I wonder if there's just code that's downloading it for us in this sample code. Uh, it oh, could yeah. be. Could be. Maybe. And then we're going to just comment all this out for now. And we'll figure out what we're going to delete after the fact here. <laughs> Make it so, work first, clean yeah. after, right? Yeah. And then write the tests, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> all obviously. Before you push to production, please write some tests. <laughs> yeah. And in your in your CI, you just have a you know return zero, and then you're done. Um, okay, so recognize printed OCR remote image. What is that? This looks like a good candidate to break out into a different file. Um, blah blah blah. Remote image computer vision dot image URL. Okay, and that is now setting the URL value and oh yeah look yeah this is built into the SDK like you said Christos nice very cool kudos to the SDK team for uh, yeah. exposing them yeah and it actually looks like you pass the image URL up to Azure oh. so I don't even I don't even know if so it's We're not even downloading, downloading locally right like it's not referencing it locally it probably passes the bits back to Azure and the OCR does the magic for you. You know, I don't know. It doesn't look like this is the SDK code right here. It doesn't look like they're downloading anything. Looks like Azure's doing it for you, for, for nice. me. So that's pretty cool. So you can do a huge, massive image, and I don't have to care about memory on my machine. I can focus on other things. So let's try this. So now, actually, what are we down to? We're down to just doing remote image recognition, remote image OCR. Just this. So let's let's see, see what happens. Not that. Let's not do that. <laughs> Ooh, what do what oh, do we yeah. got? What do we got? Nice. So the way that this works, the way that Cognitive Services does this OCR is, they split the image up into boxes they call it bounding boxes yeah um and i lied i, I do know a little bit about a ai um <laughs> it still scares it. me i knew it <laughs> <laughs> still scares me um but the way that computer vision works and the way that ocr hence works is that they try to find now this is going to be a terrible explanation but most of it will be technically correct. And if there are folks on the chat that know more than me, please call me out. Please call me out. Um, but the way that most computer vision, the basic computer vision works, and I'm sure Azure does this a lot more sophisticatedly, um, is they break the image up into boxes. Um, and a lot of times the boxes will uh, begin or end on a transition of pixels. So for example, if we're talking about a face recognition, it will try to draw a box around the features of the face. Yeah. And so that's, you know, you maybe you've seen um, even like on in movies on TV now, you know, we see the, the spy has to wear a hat and sunglasses because 
the OCR or the, the uh, computer vision face recognition is not going to recognize the face features. So it's not going to be able to scan the face. Stuff like that. But in this case, we're not talking about faces, we're talking about text. So mm -hmm. it's going to be able to figure out where's the border between the page and the text. And then it can draw a box around that. So this is actually drawing a box around a lot of different lines of text and it's giving them all to us. And the two pieces of metadata here are important because we can go back and later go back to the image and reference this box and actually see, did, did Azure get it right? We're not going to go and count pixels by hand right now, <laughs> <laughs> but we can write code to do it if we want to. True. No, that's cool. I mean, I but the whole point ago, is that, yeah, go on, JP. Years, years ago, I, I had the misfortune of having to do work with PDF. And, uh. Uh, and it's interesting, like the internal structure of a PDF. There's actually a great app called uh, PDF Can Opener. And it's oh. all about <laughs> opening the Pandora's box of PDFs. But it's actually really <laughs> similar. Here's a box. Inside that box, there's uh, this collection of text, or in most cases, about 8 million other boxes and then a single letter. And then next to that is another 45 boxes and a single letter. But um, it's kind of like like the sort of the document model, I guess, that it builds is, is kind of similar to that. So, so it's kind of neat. Yeah. I have, I too have played with PDFs and yeah, yeah I'm, I, you know, I almost quit programming. It was too much. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was pretty miserable. I uh, I would not like to ever have to do that again. Yeah. yeah, but you're. I actually never thought about it that way. You're. You're. You're right. It's. It's kind of building up a document, and boxes, and this one is kind of taking the boxes, pulling them out, and then figuring out what's in them. You almost wonder if you'd be able to create a simpler PDF. By OCRing a PDF and then building it on your own. Anyway. Well, there are libraries that allow you to take any text or any content and um, output a PDF out of that programmatically, which is doable. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so what do we have? We have a working solution now that uh, mm -hmm. grabs an image off the web, passes it on to uh, Azure Cognitive Services, and then our uh, console app receives the results back as in clear text. Mm -hmm. Now we need to fix the authentication, right? Because I, yes. I think right now we're still using um, the key yep. to speak to the Azure Cognitive Service. Yep. How do we do that? So this can, is where I may that? need y'all's help. Sure. Um, first thing, I'm going to delete some code. Now that we've got something working, I'm going to delete mm -hmm. all the... Uh, I'll keep the comment. That's important to keep. Do you not find it's a lot of noise or do you keep it as, as a reference to go back? Yeah, just a reference for now. And I, I think once I actually understand mm -hmm. fully everything, my goal would be to re rewrite this in clear language that's customized for this specific code base and this specific use case. Uh, oh, this is a comment I put in here. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm going to leave this. This is all of the other stuff. Uh, okay, and delete that. And then all the functions below we can delete except for recognize printed OCR remote image. And I think that's the last one. So we're going to delete a thousand lines of code. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, there you go. And I put a I put a link in the chat there. Uh, some of the cognitive services you can actually just upload an image and try them straight on the website, like on the marketing website. Um, so if you want to see kind of what that API outlook output looks like, um, you can go to that site and go try it out. It's pretty uh, it's pretty neat. And the cost, by the way, with uh, you get uh, for twelve months, you get five thousand transactions for free on cognitive services, con mm -hmm. computer vision. So uh, it comes with a very low cost. Uh, for that, testing uh, and running stuff. Look at that scroll bar. The old one was making me really anxious. This one's this one's in much better shape. Before we deleted all that code. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so much better now. Yeah. yeah. 1,400 to what? 400. And nice. 26. Damn. That's, that's nice. 
Not bad, yeah. So, yes, we've got to figure out how to not use this, the super secret thing that I almost doxed myself on. Um, <laughs> and I think the way to go is to use the bearer token authorizer um, instead of the built-in computer vision key authorizer. So I'm going to show another feature of Go in the process of doing this. So you can use this Azure auto rest function uh, package, actually, excuse me, and you create these things called authorizers. So right now I'm using this cognitive services authorizer. Right. That's okay. So this thing takes in a subscription key and returns this authorizer that's uh, customized, I believe, to cognitive services. But authorizer, all the authorizers adhere to this thing called an interface. Interface is pretty similar to what you're familiar with in Java or, or, or C Sharp. It's just a bunch of functions with no implementations. And if you implement those and you're custom struct, mm -hmm. then you automatically implement the interface. You don't have to explicitly say, I implement it. Right. So is that? Okay. <clears throat> so I got a question on on interfaces. Yeah. So like, yeah. some languages, you know, we we being Microsoft and, and other big places too. Some languages will go build a package to consume a service or whatever, and we build it very much how we would build a service for something like a .NET, and we're sort of mm -hmm. forcing idioms onto that language that maybe don't exist in the first place. So are think like is is an interface like a really common you know commonly used thing in Go or is that a is that sort of a Microsoft ism that's been pushed in <laughs> uh, yeah, for the yeah. purposes of writing our stuff? Yeah, and I I appreciate that question um, because interfaces are really core to Go. Okay. Go Go doesn't have a ton of features, so you'll probably hear me say everything is really core to Go. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> um, but. This one, uh, interfaces are, I would say, the second most important um, feature with respect to code organization and the first most important feature to API design and okay, in, cool. in go, go all up, not, not just the Microsoft implementations. And the reason for this is if you imagine like I build my package on GitHub somewhere else, um, I can implement this authorizer without even mentioning this library at all. Oh, right. Okay. So as, literally as long as I implement with authorization here, then I will be compatible with auto rest wow. just automatically. So it's very, very really powerful. powerful. Yeah. And also very scary. Also very scary. Yeah. But there's, there are tools that tell me, you know, when when should i when shouldn't i implement okay these things and do i already implement something that kind of good stuff. right so anyway which one which one are we ha going to use then i think we're going to use bearer authorizer I yeah because i from what i understand msal is based around bearer tokens in mm -hmm. http requests is that mm -hmm. sound right yes cool yeah. My my uh, research so far has paid off. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> my M is the, the thing to get the token, and then the service receives the token and parses it and says, "Oh, cool, yeah, you're allowed to do this," or "No, you're not." So, okay, so that would mean that authorizer is going to be this, and then this thing is going to be what gets the token. But I actually suspect that this. A ADAL OAuth token provider is going to be the thing that gets it. That's the old library, by the way. So I am uh, so ADAL is the older library for people that don't know um, uh, things about Microsoft Identity, and it is a little bit confusing. But ADAL was the first iteration of the library, the, and now we have MSAL, which is the Microsoft Identity sorry mm -hmm. Microsoft Authentication Library. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if that li that um, 
that library that you're using it has a dependency on Adel straight up rather than MSAL. Well, it's this. not. It's not the same as the. It's not the same as the Adel that we're familiar with. Oh, is it not? No, it's a. Yeah, similar name. It's, it's got the note right there. <clears throat> not related to the other Adel libraries contained <laughs> in the Azure AD org. So. I mean, that's a that's a Microsoft what? classic naming thing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that. Let's let's we have, people by. I mean, how many things have been have. called? How many things have been called Surface in the past fifteen years? I mean, <laughs> damn, yeah. I went to yeah. a I went to a Microsoft office in Independence, Ohio. So I would also again I advise not going to Independence, Ohio because there's literally nothing there except for this Microsoft office, and I had a broken Surface table in the corner, like the big table, you know, the bat, and. Uh, <clears throat> and it had this huge crack in the middle of the screen. So, like, you couldn't use it without slicing your fingers open, like that old <laughs> T-Mobile commercial with uh, Bill Hader in it. And um, and there was just something about... It was just, it's, I was, it was just, like, such an overwhelming sadness because it was winter and it was gray and there was snow everywhere and it was dirty snow because it was, gr you know, it was just gross. And then there's this broken, <laughs> forgotten table in the corner of this little office and... Oh you know, man! It's just like, oh my god, it's awful. I should write a book about this. Midnight at Independence, Ohio. Anyway, oh, continue. Man. Sorry. <laughs> wow, I'm depressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of how I felt when I left. I was like, Geez. You're, you're selling it so well, man. Yeah. yeah. Al alumni, alumni, do not come. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. So, yes, we've got to. I'm just going to put a little bit of code in here. Uh, authorizer equals this thing equals auto rest dot this thing new bearer authorizer. So, we've got to figure out what is the OAuth token provider equals who knows. Now, just one thing to remember to mention, um, this notation is a tiny bit different than other languages. Um, you still have a parameter, but the type of the parameter comes after the parameter here. And the type of the return value of the function comes after the return function, after the function declaration, not before. So in case you're confused, just remember it's flipped in, in Go. So TP is our, TP is our uh, parameter <coughs> name, right? Yes. Okay. So we actually have to figure out what that is now. And ADAL OAuth token provider. Is this thing, and that's an interface. And what are we supposed to do with this? So I have a feeling we can build this ourselves. We basically just need to have a single function and have it return a string, which is the OAuth token. Okay. It's Easy an interface job. which should be implemented by an access token retriever. Okay. Yeah, so, so in effect, you need some code that will return to you uh, an OAuth token object. Or, or it's mm -hmm. just a string, right? So technically, mm -hmm. something that grabs the token from Azure AD and passes it back. Yeah. And I can build be... this myself, but uh -huh. I think... I think I included a link in here somewhere. This library, we can use this library for MSAL with Go. And they have yeah. code somewhere in here. And this Get one is, this is uh, extremely early. So this one is, is, is sort of like a, uh, it's, it's almost like an uncommitted one. Like it's like pre private preview. So it's, it's like a, it's an alpha, right? It's, it's public because we are developing these things in public, but it is an alpha kind of a version of it. Yeah. And we are going to take a walk on the wild side and use it because <laughs> why not? do it Very live. Cool. Yeah. It's awesome. Is that, I mean, do it live, right? We're literally live. So let's, let's yeah. try it out. We are innovators here, right? Yes. Explorers of the unknown. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's so, funny because this conversation started when I reached, I think I reached out to you and said, hey, have we built anything with Go? And then I, I reached out to uh, some people in our SDKs team and we found, all well, by surprise, I think JP pointed me to, hey, by the way, there is uh, this new repo about MSAL and Go. Let's go and have a play with it. And that's how nice. we... We started the whole thing back and forth. Yeah. 
And this, this, you pointed me to this in that conversation. And I looked at this uh, uh, in a lot more depth, uh, actually yesterday. And it does a whole lot more than just this. I mean, the, the interface that we're going to build around is going to be this. But behind the scenes, you've got stuff like utilizing an in-memory cache and dealing with stale tokens and updating tokens in the background and all that stuff. It's yeah. really, really nice. Yeah, you, and... don't want to implement, you don't want to have to implement all that stuff yourself either. High risk of, uh, high risk <laughs> yeah. of error. And if nothing yeah. else, at least we've got a whole, you know, we've got teams of people who build these, and that's all they do. And so they, yeah. you know, they're, they're, we don't want people to have to be identity experts to use this stuff. So, um, Yeah, you know, can you imagine needing to do some computer vision stuff for your app? And, and then spending three weeks writing the uh, authentication code to grab the token, right? Yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> just, exactly. Just declare bankruptcy on your business and just go away because you're so depressed having to write all that off code before you can even get off the ground. Yeah, uh, it would be like, hey, yeah. boss, I managed to do the cognitive services in half an hour by using Azure Cognitive Services. Uh, <laughs> and we can do the OCR. However, I need to spend three weeks writing the auth code to wire it up. Yeah, uh, right. The boss, the boss does a double take. What? What? Yeah. Are you sure? Mm. We don't want you to be uh, in that situation. So if you are building with Azure, then uh, MSAL is the way to go. Or at least mm -hmm. any any other OpenID Connect library that allows you to do the same thing. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, be aware that we look after you by providing the libraries. And OpenID Connect, that is a an open standard, right? It is. it is. We follow standards, OAuth2 and OpenID Connect. Nice. So any library that is built on top of these standards should work with uh, Azure AD. Nice, very cool. And there are Go, there are other Go libraries specifically to do OAuth two and OpenAD. O OAuth two is built into the. Um, there's an extensions. Uh, there's an extension to the standard library um, that you can optionally get. It's built into the extension. Um, so OAuth two is like literally officially supported by the Go core developers. OpenID is a third-party library that's pretty widely used as well. So if you don't want to use this, right. yep. go use that. But I'm going to cool. use this because of the wonderful copy-paste instructions. <laughs> so before I continue, I want to make sure that this last line gives me back a string that the access to. Open. Very nice. Yes, that is a string, and that should be a string. Perfect. Okay. So I don't even need to go to the docs. However, uh, I'm going to just most show. Likely. Okay. Most likely. Okay. Let me just show then. Let me show what it's like to go to the docs. So you can go to pkg.go.dev and you can literally copy the URL of the GitHub repo without the what? HTTPS. Paste it in after pkg.go.dev. And there you go. You've got this is the same GitHub readme rendered, but yes. speechless. Yeah. Yeah. But it also now has detected sub directories called sub packages mm -hmm. in Go. And you can click on any of them. I need to figure out which one I'm going to click on. Um, we're starting with msal.create public client application. Uh, the apps, cache, blah, blah, blah. Public, is it here? What am I looking at? I may be looking in the wrong place. Well, could it be that it's not documented yet because it's so new? It could be, yeah. It's either that or I might have a different version, but let's. Instead, let's go and try this live. So this is where my new file is going to come into play. Okay. Yeah, you, you might want to do step one, which is actually registering the app okay. registration in Azure AD. Okay. And then, because we'll need to uh, fill in that information, you know, the, your client ID mm -hmm. and your tenant name. Okay. These are, this is information that we we'll probably need to pass anyway. So we might as well do the uh, right. app registration. Let's do it. Do, 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 create an account, which I have. Set up a tenant. Oh, we already have that one. Oh, yeah. yeah, you've already, right. yeah sure. Luckily, you've already got that. Cool. 
Um, sign in. I've got the right subscription already selected. Search for and select Azure Active Directory. I mm -hmm. can do that. Yeah, and some of it will depend on how Cognitive Services expects you to authenticate to. So if it's yeah, what kind of permissions it exposes and, and that sort of thing. Okay. I've never done it via Azure AD, so I'm, I'm curious to see now if we have one of these uh, Microsoft APIs that are selectable from the API permissions. I did check to make sure that Cognitive Services is compatible with MSAL. So that we've got, I mm -hmm. think we've got that so far. Cool. <laughs> as far as I got though, I figured do it live. <laughs> right, so here you need to go into app registrations uh, on the right hand side, the left hand side is an mm -hmm. app registrations. Uh, there. And mm -hmm. let's see. You just need yeah. to do a new app registration. We're going to do 425 show, um, single tenant. Yep. We'll redirect URI. Just leave it blank for now. I don't think we need to have one, but it will tell us in the instructions, shouldn't it? Yeah, let's see what it says. Uh, register, d -d -d name, <clears throat> sign an audience, register, don't enter anything. Sounds good. Yep. Okay. After I'm done registering, I get my app, add a redirect URI <clears throat> in a production, during development. Do, so does um, does it support a server to server type of environment where I don't have a redirect? It does, <clears throat> but I also I'm also curious to see what kind of um, set up the the actual uh, cognitive services require. So while mm -hmm. you well maybe maybe JP can guide you through that while I'm looking at the docs or finding the right doc. Yeah. So one of the first things it says is that our cognitive service needs a custom domain. Hmm. Ooh. Oh, God. So I think we have to create that first. I don't know if we can add that to an existing service or if we have to create a net new service with a custom domain. Well, guess what? Work. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't let you, it doesn't let you uh, add it. Even though in the docs it says you can go and add a custom domain, I tried to do it and it, I couldn't find the UI anywhere. So you have to uh, do it via the CLI and spin up a, a new cognitive service with a custom domain. Okay. Let's actually go. Uh, into some docs here, docs. Yeah, I'll I'll paste the link in the uh, chat. Oh, perfect. Okay, there. Uh, I'll open that too. So these are the steps that you need to do uh, to follow and assign a, a create an app registration that does that for us. Perfect. And this is a good opportunity to show off Cloud Shell. So I'm on Linux. I do not have uh, Azure PowerShell. Right. Or PowerShell, yeah. yeah. Although you can get it, right? Uh, with PowerShell now being open source and cross-platform, you could run yeah. it if you wanted to. I didn't even think of that. What? Anyway, I didn't think of that. But oh. I thought of this. You're the open source guy. You should be like, you guys should be installing CloudShell and PowerShell and all these things that run everywhere. You're anyway, right. for I people know. that don't know, PowerShell, I think since uh, uh, PowerShell Core, now it's PowerShell 7, it's a uh, cross-platform, it's open source, it runs everywhere. So if you want to install it locally, then you have the option. Or you can use CloudShell, which is awesome. We had, uh, mm -hmm. we had Danny uh, from the PM team to come and show us uh, PowerShell and CloudShell. Uh, just before Christmas. Nice, yeah. Well, so if you didn't see that, you literally just go to shell.azure.com. Mm -hmm. And I've got a bash one running. So this is in a Linux container. I'm going to switch to PowerShell. And this is all in the cloud. I don't have, I don't have PowerShell on my machine, like I said. So this is just in the cloud on Azure, giving me a PowerShell terminal. So now well, already, that, already authenticated. That, uh, Sorry, go on, JP. That try it button, I think, gives you essentially Cloud Shell right next to where you're working, which is kind oh, of neat. right. You are, yeah. yeah, very cool. I didn't even see that button. 
Yeah, it's not on all the docs yet, but it is cool. Like for APIs, it'll it'll give you kind of like a really lightweight API executor, and mm -hmm. you'll be able to get tokens and then PowerShell and stuff. I think it uses <clears throat> Cloud Shell to do all that, so it's pretty it's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. I'm gonna copy paste. That's so. fine. <laughs> I, uh, that works too. <laughs> yeah. Oops. So I need to get my subscription name. I think it's Aaron Schlesinger Dev. Uh, you can, like uh, yeah, you'll have to go back up a level or look in, you can search in the top for subscriptions. Yeah. I can probably put an ID in there too, huh? Yep. Yep. Sure can. I think it's, I think the flag is subscription ID, but yeah. Subscription, Instead of subscription ID. name. Alrighty. Cool. Account equals. Duh, duh, duh. We've got to fill in some things there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to create a new file here. New Azure Cognitive Services account resource group name is 425 show. So does that uh, subdomain need to be registered anywhere and accessible? That's a good question too. I don't know. <clears throat> I think it's just customizing the subdomain itself. Ah, uh, okay. Um, not like a full-blown uh, custom right. domain name. Right, okay. Yeah, it is subdomain. It does say subdomain, but we'll find yep. it. It needs to be globally unique, so that's all we need. And mm -hmm. it doesn't accept special characters. <clears throat> Obviously, it is a domain name, so we can screw up with uh, bangs and um, semicolons and commas. Mm -hmm. So what do you think I should in enter for account name and type? I see the subscription. Are, I have to go find the SKU. These are all for the cognitive service itself. Okay. So they would be, if it's like F0 or S0, whatever the free one is, if you wanted to use free or if you were using a different SKU, we well, can probably get most of that data <clears throat> off of the one that you currently have. So mm -hmm. Yeah. You have quite a few over there, by the way. Yeah, these are from all... And all the demos. Subscriptions, yeah, <laughs> demos, and et cetera. So, oh, I've got this in VS Code. There's also Name. Uh, auto, there's tab completion too in Cloud Shell. So we, we may get, we may be able to enumerate some of those. I, that's a great point. Look. Uh, looks like not for this. So this will just be, this is just a, just to be like a string name. You could call it 425 show since your other one's called 425. Yeah. Now account, account type. type. That's going to be one of the cognitive services account types. Yeah, I think I have it in here somewhere. Sta uh, computer vision. I've got the SKU. Oh. Yeah, computer vision. Yeah, computer vision. Also, what kind of uh, what kind of cognitive service you want to do, to deploy, right? We've got standard pricing tier. Yeah, SKU name like you could do like S zero. Thank you for that. I don't have to go look that up now. I love it. And then is it East US two? Yep, that's the one I use, but that's because it's close to me. <laughs> Are I'm you out west, that. Aaron? Yeah. Okay. And then custom and then subdomain. Let's do uh, the four two five show dot com. I don't think it's the whole thing. I think it's just the four two five show. Just the, yeah. Ah, subdomain. Duh. Yeah. Okay. So you're stealing our name. <laughs> I can do the like, 425 Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> like what happens later in the, in the in, in like three months? Well, I'm just kidding. How about this? The 425 uh, stream. Oh, Caparino GR says Jen. that you need to save the file as a .ps1 to actually get auto completion working. Uh, because it doesn't know it's a PowerShell file. Well, the, oh, okay. Code, code, Thank you, Caparino. Saving the day in, again. We were in. Cloud Shell. True. Oh, we tried in Cloud Shell and didn't work? Yeah, we tried tab uh, completion in here. Didn't. 
think sometimes oh, there it it's is. a little bit slow. There it I think is. sometimes it's a little bit slow. Uh, <laughs> I just I had it's to. It's fine. Let's do it this way. I like I like this. I'm a fan of lazy laziness. <laughs> Name four two five show type is going to be computer vision. Skew name. S0. Maybe that one doesn't autocomplete. It doesn't, yeah. Changes expected. Upcoming breaking changes in the command led, blah, blah, blah. Oh, there okay. they are. Well. F, F0 and S1, it looks like, on the next line right down. Oh, yeah, there. there it is. Yeah. They really buried the lead there, huh? <laughs> And then location. There, there it are. is. Yeah, it takes a while. Uh, location is going to be East US. I'll just do. I'll do. Uh, yeah, West US too. You scroll oh, up a little bit. Sure. Right now, your head is in front of uh, the bottom uh -oh. of your screen. Okay. So. How do I? Uh, is there a way to scroll in the command line on PowerShell? Oh no, so. we can't. That's okay. I can do a copy. Nope, not that. There you go. Feature request for the team. I actually will. I will give them that feature request. There's a clear, but oh, there is somewhere yeah, here. A... Uh, oh, just a command clear. Oh. Uh. Or this CLS. shows how how good I am at PowerShell. Okay. CLS, CLS is uh, Unix and Clear is Windows, right? There is a Clear on Unix too. And then custom uh, subdomain. Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay, thank you. Almost there. I think it was custom subdomain name. Name. Thank you. Yeah. And no.com. That's right. Thank you for that, too. All right. I think we've got it. Let's All try right. it. And now we'll wait for half an hour while the service is no, no. All right. <laughs> yeah, we're good. I'm just messing. I'm just messing with you guys. Come on. Um, it has a plain text password. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm going to do this in the secret, the super top secret. Oh, wait. Here. That's for the uh, service principle. Yeah. Yeah, so I can just come up with a password. It actually generates one for you. Oh, oh wait a minute. Oh, you that. need to... Wait a minute. Have we done... We've done the uh, operating session, so now we need to... I'm confused. Well, which which step is this one? So we've done the... Uh... It, 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 we don't, looks... It's okay. We don't, we don't need this because you already did it. So let's just go down to step oh. three. So you've, we've okay. already created... When you went to the portal to create that app, <clears throat> the app registration in Azure AD, it pretty much did steps one and two for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. now what we need is uh, we have to assign this cognitive services user role. Mm -hmm. Well, do we not need to go first and create the secret for us? The client secret and uh, the app registration? Uh, order of operations doesn't really matter too much here. Oh, so, okay, okay. Okay. Because we won't need them until we get there. So sure. now that we have the, the service principle, that's sort of the thing that's going to represent it. Uh, mm -hmm. the, that's the securable object. So that's the thing we're going to say. Mm -hmm. This service principle has rights to your cognitive service. Right. So you can do it this way, <clears throat> which is you. we have to go find the object ID and the account ID. Or you can just do it mm -hmm. in the portal, and the portal will probably be 10 times faster than searching around for uh, for IDs in, uh, in yep. your non-first PowerShell language. So well, That sounds good. So let's yep. uh, let's go to your new resource, the one that we just uh, created, which hopefully should be there. Yep. Yeah. And under I am uh, access control up near the top. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Here we can add a role assignment, and the role is going to be cognitive services, uh, cognitive services user. This is going to be lets you read and list keys. Mm -hmm. Do we want? Do we want a uh, custom vision as well? I don't think we need the custom vision one uh, per the docs, okay. but we can go back and check the doc to see. Okay. And then for the uh, user group or service principle, we want to find the service principle that you created. So do you remember what the name of that app was that you created? Um, yeah, I think it was the, I think it was just 425 show. 
Okay, search and so user group or service principle is fine. Search for it here. We may have to be more, we may have to get more specific about it. It is likely that first one. Yeah. Um, okay. So now selected members are there, so go ahead and assign. And so now that service principle that you created by virtue of registering that application, that service principle is now available. And it's been assigned Great. role. It's been assigned rights at least to go and read the keys. So one of the things we've seen a lot of the teams doing um, is they want to get Azure Active Directory authentication out to their service, but um, you know it may require some sort of big service change or whatever. So what we see a lot of them doing is something like this, where well I'm signed in uh, with with Azure AD, and what that account's going to do is have rights <clears> to go get the keys and then go talk to the service. So the service hmm. itself, itself is still expecting a key, per, perhaps, um, but it's all sort of done, it's done under the covers for you, and a lot of the, a lot of the SDKs are doing that. But uh, in this case, I think we're still gonna end up, we're still gonna end up uh, getting an access token from Azure AD and then sending it into our service and the service will figure it out. And without that role assignment, we would have gotten, a, we wouldn't have been allowed to do it. I see, I see. So this role assignment is, for this code to go and grab the key, mm -hmm. correct, and then I'll be taking the key and passing it, and that's a different that's a, a different access control that I am doing with the key, passing it into cognitive services, right? Yep. Um, in a in a way, so what we're going to do, this code is going to go get an access token from Azure AD, which is completely mm -hmm. unrelated to cognitive services. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to say, when we put in the request, we're going to say, give me an access token and give me that access token for cognitive services. Ah, uh, okay. And so that's like a scope and that's going to come back mm -hmm. and say, okay, cool. You have access to this. Uh, so here's a token. And when you send that token into the cognitive service, it's going to parse it and figure out, okay, cool. This guy, this account does or does not have, uh, does permissions or does not to have permissions to do this. Great. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and I saw here in the go, you you give it a list of scopes, mm -hmm. pass it in, and then that. Okay. Yep. This makes sense. Yep. Interesting. What would the scope uh, be for cognitive services now? Uh, it is uh, the scope is HTTPS colon whack whack cognitive services dot azure dot com whack. Oh. Can you say that one more time so I don't have to go look up the docs? <laughs> where did where'd you find it, by the way, JP? Because yeah. a lot of people may be wondering, like, how it's, do I get the resource it, name for that specific in the service? It's in, it's the, in the doc. doc. Oh, okay. Yeah. A little bit there further down. Reading the go. docs. Acquired that there acquire token is. async that we have there. Yep. Cognitive oh, services right. at azure.com. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. And sometimes the, uh, the presence or absence of a trailing slash is usually quite important, too, because... Um, so make sure that it matches, which it does. But you, there's, there have definitely been cases where people have said, oh, I can't get this. And we look, and sure enough, it's missing a backslash or, or missing mm -hmm. a trailing slash, or it needed one. So, um, Okay, so now we're to the point where um, we've got most of the information we need to start working in our code. Um, we also need, so we need a client ID, which is your application ID. So that application that we registered, we need that ID. Inside Azure AD. Yep. So that would be in the overview. Mm -hmm. That is in the, so that's back in Azure AD. That's the, the oh, app this registration. Oh, is not that. Oh, okay. Yep. Sorry about that's that. That's the app registration that we created. Active Directory. Yeah, it'll be under app registrations, about halfway Where down the left. There, thank you. All right. And your since you created it, it, should be under owned somewhere, and I think you called it four two five show. So you probably just search for it. Oh, maybe not. Mm, no, it's twenty seventeen. <laughs> um, about all. I guess it's not owned. What? That's okay. That's okay. You may just not be the owner by default. That's fine. So we need that application ID. Um, now you're also going to need a secret, and the secret is not something you're going to want to share. So you're not going to want to generate one on the screen with us, and you're not going to want to put it directly in your code like that. But can you do uh, an environment variable? Mm-hmm. On the left-hand side, 
Yeah, on the left side you'll have uh, certificates and secrets as a menu option, and you can generate a secret in there. Perfect. New client secret. So I'm mm -hmm. going to click on this. Mm -hmm. we'll generate and it's going to show up you. in that value field. Make All sure right. it's the value and not the GUID, not the ID. Okay. Yeah. So I just show Beaten by that before. I am going to create one that exp I'll just make it one, one year. One year is fine. Yeah. They added so, never, but we we would never suggest anyone use never. So, yeah, and of course right, you can so always I'll come in and this. you can always come in and delete it immediately after if you do yep. happen to accidentally show it. So, okay, all right. So then I'm going to grab the value, not the ID. I'll put that into an environment variable, and then I'll fetch that value of the environment variable in the code. Yeah, cool. All right, I'll do it off screen here. Easy Wildfire is uh, sending jokes in the chat, but uh, I think everyone is so uh, enamored with Go and making it work that uh, we're not paying attention. He's a little bit hurt. <laughs> <laughs> we're laughing internally, uh, Easy Wildfire. How about that? If Mississippi bought Missouri and New Jersey, what would Delaware? Oh. <laughs> I mean, I'm very thoroughly, I am very thoroughly in the throes of being a dad, and even that makes me cringe. <laughs> <laughs> Dad joke, cringe. You, you can do better, AZ Wildfire. You can do better. Yeah, come on, AZ Wildfire. Let's go. <laughs> Step it up. Oh, code, code it. with Sean is uh, with us this morning. Hey, Code with Sean. Glad you joined us. I thought you had enough of us uh, in the last two or three days. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean. We, we, we were on Code with Sean's user group last night. I didn't mean to leave and make everybody else leave. I just I had to get going because it was late. And it looked like everybody left after I did. Chris was like, yeah, I'm leaving too. See you. Uh, <laughs> well, well I, I was tired, man. I was. I, it was a long day. No one chuckled. I chuckled. It took me a second to catch on, but I got you, AZ Wildfire. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> So we've seen this before. Um, we just get os dot get env. os is mm -hmm. a standard library package. Get environment variable. I called it that when I did my export msal secret equals my super top secret thing. Now, if you don't want to store secrets, you can always use a certificate uh, for the, uh, those ones that are watching. So technically, uh, we want to avoid secrets altogether and just use a certificate that you upload onto your app registration, and then you also load in your code. So is that a standard like X509 yep. seek, uh, certificate? Yep. Yep. Sweet. Good to know. Yeah, once, mm -hmm. yeah, once you're in production, that's the way to go. And if you're going to run this in Azure, you can skip all of the secret silliness and use the, use a managed identity, which is um, mm. uh, it's, so it's awesome. an endpoint that's built into a VM and built into app service and uh, can... AKS, most of the compute services have it now. And it gives your resource an identity, and that resource's mm -hmm. identity is what is used to go and talk to those services. Kind of how, like, in AWS, you can say, hey, this VM is in the security group that gives us access to this S3 bucket. It's pretty much the mm -hmm. same thing, only it's available for any Azure AD protected resource. So you can make service-to-service cool. service calls, you can call other Azure services, whatever. Very cool. So we've attached... A, an Azure ID identity to my app via mm -hmm. the secret, mm -hmm. but I could do that with managed identity or certificate. If so you're running now, in Azure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Managed identity only if you're in Azure. Well, te yep. technically, if you're using the Azure SDK, which you are, you can also use um, the local authentication properties. That should work, right? Local. Yeah. Well, there's the Azure Identity Library that also looks at your currently logged in uh, account oh. in VS or the CLI or PowerShell. Oh. And then it will try to work out if there is already a token there they can use. Uh, and if you're already authenticated with one of these, and as long as your account or the account that is logged into these services has access to, say, cognitive services or anything else, it will automatically work. So you don't have to change the code between dev and production. Wow. I think that's I a different that. SDK. I don't think that's part of the Azure SDK. The Azure Identity? No, no. I don't think the Cogno Services SDKs are part of that. I think it is. Okay. Good luck. Let I, me I find. I don't know. I don't think they are, but that's Let cool. me find it. Maybe they are. 
Okay, dot ms and I will look at that while Aaron is trying to figure out. I mean, you still technically need to get. Oh yeah, you're right. That wouldn't work. That wouldn't work. I'm just trying to think now. Okay, so now we've got. So we've got our client ID, we've got our secret, we've got our scope. So now we need to go and request, uh, we need to go request the token. Uh, and that's what our, that's what our MSAL code is going to do. So, mm -hmm. so this is called a public client application. And public client applications are a little bit different. Um, a public client's like something that, like a piece of software you're going to ship to somebody else. So a mobile app, a desktop app, uh, a JavaScript single page app. And the reason they're called public clients is because they are, um, essentially running in places that are out of your control and they can't keep a secret, right? Public mm -hmm. things can't keep secrets. So instead, what we're going to use is what's called a confidential client. And most of the code is going to be similar, but instead of creating a public client application, we're going to create a confidential client application. So let's go look at the docs for that. Okay. Nice. That worked uh, that well. Goes <laughs> different link that we got to do. There's an old Godox link and a new one. So we're going to go to the new one. We can literally just go and do pkg.go.dev for this. Okay. And just to uh, to clear the record, I stand corrected. There's no cognitive services in the Azure SDKs. There's only cognitive search. Mm. Search. So there you go. Okay. Thanks for uh, highlighting that. So that so we're going to create that new confidential client application. And then if you look down about three where we have acquire token by client credential, mm -hmm. uh, that's what we're going to use to go and uh, get our token. So we have to, we got to create okay. the MSAL object first, and then we're going to use that acquire token by client credential. That's going to take your client ID in secret, almost like a username and password. And mm -hmm. then, uh, and then fire it off and we should get a token back. Mm -hmm. Sweet. And there it is. Yep. So it gives us back this authentication result which gives us a token. Yep. Sweet. Okay. Also so let's figure out. In there. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Let's figure out what to do with this. Um, so we've got to get a, got to return this, um, where was it? Bear authorizer. We've got to make a to OAuth token provider. So we've got to make a thing that has this function on it. Right. Let's do this. token provider. And we need this one method. OAuth token string. Okay. So this is pretty standard go. Basically, Go doesn't have classes, it has structs. So basically, you can think of this as sort of like a class. I'm not going to go too deep into it. This is sort of like a method on the class. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, we can go deeper into it once we get something working. So 18, we're going to do... We have 18 minutes. 18 minutes. All right. Let's get into it then. Easy peasy. Easy Length of time. Peasy. We've yeah. done worse. <laughs> That's true. We have. What did we do last night? It was like thirty-eight minutes. Let's see how much code we can slam in in thirty-eight minutes. <laughs> hey, did, did we finish that one, or do we need to uh, to do any no. more work? No, I got to finish all that before three o'clock. Actually, <laughs> nice. we can continue streaming afterwards if you want. Yeah, maybe we will. That might be a good idea. We have yeah. to be off of MS Developer. Off uh, MS Developer, minutes. yeah. So now we need to have a client credential and create client credential from assertion certificate or secret this is what cool. we need cool and so create clients i'm just going to copy the whole thing here technically i should be doing some checking here to see if that environment variable is missing but i'm not going to do that brute force it for now fix it yep. later yep yep and then Usually, when we see something like this, options, and then a pointer to this, mm -hmm. usually you can just say null here. Because oh. the pointer, you can say null, and then it'll just use the default. Okay. I hope. I <laughs> hope that's going to happen. 
Wait, and null, not, null is with N I L rather than N U L L? Yes. Why? It's trying to make your life harder. Consistency in our lives. It's trying to make your life harder. <laughs> yeah. There's you know, also that, no that exceptions made, in Go. That made it for me. I'm not learning Go. <laughs> the, the nil bro broke me. Oh, There's no well, exceptions. There's no exceptions. That's that one breaks most people. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I mean, catching, catch, uh, sorry, uh, catching exceptions is, is an expensive operation, so I can see why not. But how do you do defensive programming? Right there. So right there. you can return multiple. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be very underwhelming to you. <laughs> Believe me, though, you get used to it. Um, errors are values. They're not okay. obviously not exceptions. You can return one or more values mm -hmm. from any function. So it's. It, this is done by convention. You know, people always return the error as the second or the final mm -hmm. value from a function if a function can return an error. Okay. And then Go will force you to use any variable that you have in your code. So if I, so actually this is a great example right here. App declared right. but not used. If I didn't do this if, then it would say error declared but not used. So you have to address the error this way. So in your Go code, you'll see the, these three lines of code sprinkled everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. That's, that's everything right there. And that's what usually gets most people. That's when they quit. <laughs> if you can get over this, you can get over anything. <laughs> so um, we call confidential client application we get back our application and then acquire token. What was it again? Acquire token by client credential, mm -hmm. right? We pass in scopes. Yep. All right. And that returns an error as well. And now scopes. So we've got string. And the scopes are, I have them in here somewhere. Either of you have them handy? Cognitive services. The cognitive services at Azure.com. It's uh, your cog service scope oh, constant up in the yes. top. Yes. Yep. Thank you. I forgot already. I forgot. We've been practicing. It's really the only scope. I think that's the only scope we need for the moment. Yep. Sweet. Okay. So we get this okay. result back. Um, granted in the client scopes, gives us the account. What we need to return is the access token though. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. So technically a lot of this stuff is set up. We should put this in a different function for mm -hmm. now. We're going to leave it as is. Okay. Now, they have some information about a cache. Uh, we don't need to worry about a cache because we're doing, what we're doing is called client credentials, which is an app uses its own credentials to connect instead of a specific mm. user. If you're okay. using it, if a user was signing in, like usually the user signs in and then at some point you need to go and make an API call that you need a token for and you need a cache for that. Client credentials, okay. in this case, since we're using client credentials, we don't really use a cache. Okay, they I, I don't even they don't even say how to use the cache. Maybe it's already built into this function or something like that. So, yeah, the M, the MSAL cache itself, you don't typically have to re-implement the whole cache. All you are, all you implement are the uh, persistence methods to write to your storage provider of choice. But mm. there's an in-memory one that comes along out of the box. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, what we've got to do here is just create our token provider. Yeah. And the reason that this is erroring out is because this pointer matters. Uh, oh, okay. So if I create a straight up token provider here, this mm -hmm. is creating a value, right? The, the token provider. And OAuth token provider has the value type of token provider. But right here, this is saying you can only call this method, which is the one we need, on a pointer to a token provider. 
So not a big deal. We can do this. Now we can say OAuth token provider. We are going to both create the memory for token provider and then return a pointer to that memory. And that's going to be the pointer is going to be stored in OAuth token provider. We could it's also do like, this. It's almost like a by ref then. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. Go calls them pointers, but so they're similar to references, but they're explicit. Yeah. So nothing in Go is by default by ref or by value. It's explicit which okay. one you, you're doing. Okay. So will this so, run? Yeah, let's try it. This is downloading the new MSAL dependencies. Mm -hmm. uh, module, blah, 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 at latest. Let's not use latest. <laughs> I don't know what we needed, but we need to use this version. We need to uh, we need to be sticky on our yep. version. Uh -huh. yep. Is that because there's nothing released? Like none of them are like a V one. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so like a pre pre release packages, you need to explicitly reference the the version. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. And once you get it, so you just mm -hmm. saw like when I did go run, it downloaded these things. Yep. It's fixed after that, but I can uh -huh. go in, of course, and I can change it if I'd like. Be explicit. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm going to do that. Uh, let me copy this first. Microsoft Authentication Library for Go. Put it at the top here. And after that, I'm going to just see if we can use the, the latest one. I doubt this will work, but it's a place to start. Is that the no. latest one? No, that's the... Let's see it. Yep. Is that the latest one? No, that's... Looks like the, it. December 28th is the latest one, isn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that's in 2019. Ah, my bad. <laughs> my bad, yo. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Oh, boy. All right. So let's try it again. It should download the new thing. Uh, are, are all the uh, Go packages on GitHub, or are, are, is there a poster like MVN and NuGet that you can call as well? Um, I will try to keep this as short of an explanation as I can. So Go dependency management has changed a bunch. Okay. This, what you're seeing right here, is the very latest and the now the officially supported long-term solution for it. Okay. So dependencies are federated in Go. Mm -hmm. You can get a dependency directly from GitHub, directly from Azure, uh, Azure repos, directly from GitLab, a bunch of other providers. You can get it literally directly from there. And there's tooling that will help you do like a Git clone at a specific version and then use that. Very nice. The officially supported one here, dependencies are still federated. So the stuff that you're looking at here this is being pulled directly from GitHub in this case. You see there, right. GitHub. But the actual source code that I need to download is being automatically downloaded behind the scenes from a server that's hosted by the Go team. Okay. Understood. So the, the server is proxy.golang.org. Um, one of the projects that I work on, though, is actually an alternative to that server that you can download and run yourself. But for now, you know, it's very easy. I can just download it uh, in the background. By default, I download it from their hosted thing, and it, I'm good to go, which is really nice. Yeah. So let's see. So we're good to go. Uh, we've got a compile error now, which means we're in business. Line 21 of auth.go right here. Confidential client application. It might need Create. the client ID in it, too. Uh, so actually, what this is saying is that oh, no. create client credential returns two uh, values, but I'm only checking for one. So again, I need this common thing. Put the error in there. Try it again. Okay. Uh, service return an error. Access token is missing. What? Okay. That's, a good, that's a so, good start. Yeah. Yes. So let me close Invalid that. audience, it said. Go back to the error message. Did you capture that, JP? Invalid so audience. 
it's the token is missing invalid or the audience is incorrect or it's expired. Mm. So let's do this. Uh, so run this and then can you print the token somewhere that you get? Yeah, put a breakpoint. Yeah. Well, we'll just go look at the token and see here. what we're getting back. Because it could be that we're not getting a correct token. It could also mm -hmm. be that we're not getting, that it's not being pushed into the SDK correctly, so. Yeah. Got nothing. Mm. Got no token. Okay. Ooh. That's good. So, yeah. So that maybe something's up with our secret. You know what? I didn't check the error. So that will probably tell us something. Yeah. Right. Like missing missing environmental variable or yeah. secret invalid or whatever. Okay. Response is missing access underscore token. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So that means that the request is going out, but it's oh, um, Hmm. You're gonna say Let me something. Do another sanity sanity check here while you're thinking. Just in case mm -hmm. I called this the wrong thing. Okay. So the environment variables there. Cool. Now response is missing access token. So we're not getting the access token. Right. So it's uh, and the scope is cognitive service cognitive services dot azure dot com. Yeah. Double check that. Correct. HTTPS. Yep. Yeah, okay. And if backslash as well, so it's it's all there. It would be just hmm. not returning it. I think the problem lies with line 25. And you got a secret, right? Or sorry, the 25 and 29. And got the secret, just, check for so that. You, okay, so this, we do get the So the secret's there. Mm -hmm. um, when you created the secret, this is a silly question. When you created the secret, did you hit save at the top? Well, let's just make sure here. <laughs> Uh, you may not actually. You may not have to do that, but um, okay. Just it won't show it right now. So if you go to certificates okay. and secrets, but well, shouldn't show it right now. I'll say that. And it yeah, show it's it. uh, it's it must. Does. It's fine. <laughs> I dox it, myself. I'll delete this after okay. the. Oh, fact. it's fine. So we've got a secret. Well, you don't need to save it, right? Um, go back to the app registration that you just had, and uh, not the secrets page, but go to the uh, yeah. API permissions page. Uh, where is that? Middle, the middle, right there, uh, a little bit further down. Oh, there, there you go. go. Yeah. Um, all right, let me check one thing. We shouldn't, because you've got that role. So this role is cognitive services user. That's the role that we're in. Hmm. So let's see, cognitive services user. All oh, that looks good. Our app doesn't need any special scopes or anything. So uh, let's see. We've got our app, and so we've got our context, we've got our secure password, or our password, we've got our app ID. So why wouldn't we get a, uh, go back to your code for a quick minute. Um, change your scope, or after your scope, put a uh, dot default after it. Um, and you can do it in the string, it's fine. Oh, in the string, gotcha. Yeah, so just cognitiveservicesizer.com forward slash dot default. Just we like may that. have to add a second slash, but let's run this first and see if that works. Alrighty. Okay, go add a second slash before the dot default. Oh, sorry, All not right. one at the end. Uh, we don't need one at the end. But dot two slash. slashes after. Just two slashes after com and then a dot. Yep. Just like that? Yep. All right. No, we're hmm. still not getting an access token. I wonder why. Uh, oh, something, nice. Something's not right. So we've got our, we've got our secrets. We've got everything. Create, uh, da, 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 da. acquire token by client credential, and then the string is our 
Cognitive Services Scope. Hmm. Can we see what that token, or the whole token object, like can, uh, scopes that were there, and uh, it said like denied scopes and accepted scopes, I think. Also, we're gonna carry we're gonna carry on on the uh, on our other channel. So come over to if you're not on the Forty Five Show already, we're at aka ms forward slash Forty Five Show or just Forty Five Show on Twitch. Uh, we're gonna drop off a of Microsoft Developer here so that we can make room for Frank, but we'll uh, we'll stay on Forty Five Show for uh, for a few more minutes and see if we can't uh, see if we can't get this sorted out. So thanks for watching. We'll be back next week, and uh, come on over to the Forty Five Show and we'll uh, see if we can't make this work. We're gonna do it. We're not quitting until we do it. Nope. All right. So okay. we got nothing. That is super weird. Do you want to raid anyone, JP, with the Microsoft developer, or just let everyone just follow? Well, I, think Frank, I think Frank's coming up right after this. Okay. So why wouldn't you be able to get... I wonder if there's something in the library. Um... Looks like it probably does. It just blanks it out and doesn't return anything. So let's see. Uh, so this is msal go confidential client app. Let's see. Are you looking at the library? Yeah, I'm looking to see if we've got any info on why this may not work or if mm -hmm. confidential clients aren't supported yet or something, but let's go see. Um, so what, oh, so that pulls the version. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, do, 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 do. Here is, uh, oh, this is for .NET, but they link yeah. to it from... Contains the results of one token acquisition operation and blah, blah. This seems like, I'm guessing this is nothing more than what you explained already. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, let me search. Let's see if I can search for access token and the issues. See if anybody else has hit this. Uh, acquire token silent doesn't work. Device close. Okay. Da, 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 da. <laughs> is there a log of like attempts that I've made in here of API calls that I've made? No. Okay. Not in here. I mean, well, we won't be able to see it because you're in the corp tenant and you wouldn't have access to the logs. Mm. Okay. Um, but I'm almost wondering if because this is so early, I almost wonder if we have to have a cache, even though we don't need mm. one. Like, I wonder if we still have to configure that. Mm, Let's see. Okay. Uh, public and confidential, blah, 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 blah. There's, so we've got code for the public ones. No, it says cache is optional, so we shouldn't have to have that. Uh, I wonder maybe if we need to set it up to maybe there's a bug somewhere. Uh, we've got but that's not throw. That's that's the other weird thing, right? Uh, hang Could on. there we've be a? a... Well, remember it doesn't throw. Here we've got some sample apps. Confidential go to confidential dot go. Okay, uh, it's in the it's in the repo if you want to go take a look. So let's see here. That's the confidential client with certificate. Um. From pen. Okay, this is using the uh, certificate rather than. Mm -hmm. It should be exactly the same though, just a different um, initialization no, of the confidential client. This isn't the usage. This is the actual. This is the the client. So acquire oh. token by credential. Where is acquire by client secret? Or acquire? Let's see. <laughs> New cred hey, we're, we're explorers, so it's uh, it's fine. Yeah, and this is an early library. Let's look at confidential test. So there's a certificate. Uh, what? Oh, no, those tests aren't very useful. Examples. That's very weird. <laughs> Acquired token by client credential. MSAL is that. Dev apps. 
Ah, here's a client secret sample. Client secret sample. So in uh, in the library in apps tests dev apps. This is where it looks like we've got some. So there's acquire token uh, client secret. That's got new cred from secret, confidential.new, which is an, an, a little bit different from the way we've initialized it, but maybe it's just a matter of preference. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're doing is an acquire token silent as opposed to doing acquire mm. token by confidential or by... Uh, oh. oh, no, no, no. It's doing, it, it's doing the silent in the acquire token client secret, right? So yeah, they just wrote a little function here. What is your... So what... Um, should we maybe follow the, should we copy 17 to uh, 33 and just use that one instead of calling directly the uh, acquire token challenge? I... It looks like, yeah, so... so they're doing confidential dot, what is this? Confidential dot new cred from secret. We already have a secret. Mm -hmm. So I assume this acquire token by credential what is the analog of that? That's this, right? They're doing, mm -hmm. yeah, acquire token by credential. I'm doing acquire token by client credential. Is there a difference, do you think, there? Let me take a look. So, maybe there is no acquire token by credential. I Maybe see acquire token it's by a, it's a I see it in the dev branch, acquire token by credential. Hmm. Mm. Okay. Let's see, what's that doing? So that's doing Hmm. So what does it say in the docs? What does it say the best way to what does it say the way that what methods we have available? The client credential one? Acquire token by auth code, device code. So those are all uh, public ones for apps. Client, and then, and then there's client credential. Okay. Yeah, that's username, client password. Yeah, I mean, client credential at least is at least the one that sounds correct. Let me let me look in the repo. Acquire token was acquire token by client credential. See if maybe something's changed. There's some major dev branch stuff going on here that we're not taking advantage of. Is it, is it possible to pull them out or do you need to download and compile locally for you to be able to use it? We can download the code for sure. Uh, we can also just depend on this commit and the latest commit in the dev branch. Oh, okay. That's nice. If we want. Oh, you pass the, the hash and allows you to mm -hmm. reference that as a... Wow. Yeah, I had had updates two days ago, so that seems to be the most fresh one. Maybe we should try that. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll try and take a look. We'll see what's changed. Yeah, let's do let's it. Let's see. Confidential client uses base client as an embedded... embedded uh, and we're going to comment that out. <laughs> oh, boy. Just so we can go back to something. There's and... a very interesting, uh, a very interesting comment in here. It's funny. Oh. Have people take note. Are you going to share? Or is it nothing? It's not something you can share or I'll say for I'll let you discover that one on your, on your own. <laughs> on <laughs> that issues. Not, definitely not something we want to read. So okay. New, so there's new cred from secret, and then there is let's see. Uh, ah. I just have to do a go get on this. Yeah, it looks like the latest one is acquired token by credential. Um, what? Oh, I have to take this out. I have to do that command again. There we go. 
Okay. Okay. Mm hmm. Ah, oh, they've changed everything. Okay. Obviously. <laughs> Why not? I mean, <laughs> it's it's still in the alpha stage, right? So that means yeah. that um, they're iterating through the API to make sure that it has the best surface. We're living on the edge, that's for sure. I'm uh, cutting edge for sure. I mean, yeah. Getting the dev branch and running through the latest commit, that is brave. Yeah. This is, I'm guessing this is the way to go. Uh, let's see. So we have to do slash apps slash confidential, I suppose. And we're in territory where this may not even be in the, I actually don't even know if this is in these docs, so we may have to just go and look at yeah, it looks the like code. the method now is acquire token acquire token by credential instead of by client mm. credentials at the very bottom of that confidential.go file. I gotcha. Okay, so that's yep. going to be a client. Acquire token by credential, and we need to create a client. I think I remember seeing in that sample file... Yeah, so the New sample cred. files, that was an apps test dev apps. Alrighty. And that New it looks like from see. secret. So we've got that done. We've got our credential, and now we've got. New. Client ID, client credential, and then no options. Okay. Okay, so that's now we're updated to the new thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, undefined offline 30. Didn't save the file. <laughs> Man, I've done this before. Uh, we do, we uh, do this all the time. Code. Just, yeah. Okay, so now it panicked. This is kind of like, well, this nice. is a null pointer exception. Oh, uh, snap. I have a feeling I know where it is, but let's see if our code okay. is somewhere in here. I'm just looking for a stack frame that's got R code. Main.go line 90 and then line 107. We've got 90, which goes down into here, 107. Client dot recognize printed text. What? Have, and we would, have we gotten a, we've already gotten a, uh, we've already gotten a token at that point? Good question. Recognize? Oh, we didn't. It didn't print. Oh, didn't print anything out. Hmm. So I think that we did get past. So, let's see. Yeah. Can we, we can we comment? Token, can we right? comment out those lines that are messing things up, and then just uh, print out the the token? Um, I think what's happening here is that this is being called, and then this is calling into mm -hmm. yeah. this. So if we uh, comment that out, we're going to comment out everything. But right. we can start commenting out stuff in here mm -hmm. and see what we break sure. or don't yeah. break. So let's start with this. I'm going to do this. I should have done an empty string. Yeah, and then it'll uh -huh. fail, but at least we're... Mm -hmm. All right, that's good. Okay. I mean, we didn't really do much there, but True. getting there. Uh, 401, listen. which was unauthenticated, which is great. Yeah. Small baby steps. Baby steps, exactly. Okay. I don't even need the log. We're just gonna. Mm -hmm. I will log the app just for the heck of it.
All right. That's now we know where it is. Okay. Invalid memory address. So it's this right there. This nil. So what's that new expecting? The new is expecting a. This is a variadic argument, so it's expecting one or more options. Okay. Mm -hmm. the option is a function. Should we just pass the uh, the options that has there, like authority, yeah. public cloud? Uh, well, we just have to pass in a function that looks like this. Okay. I think it's it's going internally and it's trying to call the function, oh, but you can't call nil. Because it's null, it just exactly. can't find the other space and it throws. Okay. Exactly. So let's It doesn't try. throw, sorry. It doesn't throw exceptions. It just logs an error. Well, it's a it's a panic. So this a panic is sort of like an exception, but <laughs> you can't do it in any other place but to crash the program. So you can't catch a panic. Right. So, so we're Does not going to do Doesn't that make uh, debugging a little bit tricky? I mean, if it just throws addresses there, like a memory address. There actually is a debugger for Go. Um, mm -hmm. We're doing it the you know the bad way by just printing. Yeah, stuff. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's there's a user kind of a user framework to do your own stack frames if you want. Okay. But the better way is to just use the debugger. Okay. Everyone's holding their breath. It didn't. Okay. It didn't panic. Okay. Oh. And we still get our four hundred one. So we got, so we got our client ID though. That's good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> it almost. We've got our client ID. We don't have our scopes. Our scopes don't seem to be there, which is kind of weird. Yeah, because we didn't. We're still not doing this oh, stuff. Oh, we haven't done that yet. Okay. okay yeah. Cool. Yep. All right. So let's move on then. Let's do it all. Yeah. Why not? Do it live, right? And then but we're backtracking. Yeah, right. Oh, and then don't return nothing. Here goes. Cross your fingers. Okay. No, no, that's good. All, All right. right. It's not um, configured to be multi-tenant. Okay, oh. good. Good. So this means that we went, we made it out to Azure AD, and Azure AD's blown up and said, sorry, we can't do this. So what we need to do mm. is we actually have to set, we're probably going to have to set an option. Um, okay. So one of the options should be authority, and we'll authority. just set the we'll, we'll just set the authority to be. Uh, we're actually going to cheat a little bit. Our authority is going. Uh, uh, we're going to set the authority to be sts.windows.net forward slash tenant. So grab that tenant GUID there, that directory tenant ID, uh, mm -hmm. that middle one. Second from grab, the top. Yeah, grab that application that. or te directory tenant. or application. Yeah, directory. Okay, perfect. You know that little uh, thing that lights up right next to the GUID? If you click mm -hmm. that one, it copies the GUID. Perfect. Alrighty. So back in our, so actually we're going to need those options, right? Because we're going to have to set our authority mm -hmm. and it looks like we can set the authority in that options block. Okay. So. But it, it, if we had registered the app registration as a multi-tenant, would you still need to pass the authority? Probably not, right? No, it's because of how it's it's because uh, of how Cognitive Services is doing it. Okay. Oh, look. There, what about that with authority? We can just set that, can't we? Mm -hmm. There looks like yeah. there's a function down a little perfect. further that with authority. We can just set that there, right? Yes, that's perfect. But do you still need the functions or just uh, sorry the options? Um, yes. Yeah, so the way this is working is it says. It's going to give you a function with a pointer to the options. Okay. You have to do whatever you need to do to configure the options. After sure. they run the function, this after they run this callback for you, then they'll use the new one that you gave it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, follow the pointer to options using the, the pointer dereference. And then we're going to say with authority. Ah. And then okay, that's the use... thing. Not, it's not just that. Use uh, HTTPS, uh, sts.windows.net, forward slash that GUID. And Perfect. let's run that and see if see, see how far we get. Right. Do we need a forward slash at the end of the GUID? I don't think so. Maybe, but okay. I don't think so. We'll find out. Uh, with authority there. returns an option, right? Oh, this is like the chained, the chained stuff that they do everywhere else, or they do in .NET. Oh, this is an options. 
not an option. <laughs> ah. But it has an authority in it, so we can probably just do that dot authority. Okay. Uh huh. So you can initialize the options with the authority directly rather than passing it later on. Yeah. Like who knows why there's an option and an options? I have no <laughs> idea. But this, uh, what we wrote here is a shorthand for this, by the way. It okay. automatically dereferences the pointer. Yeah, nice. All right. So let's try now. Might not be the right authority, but we'll find out. Uh, okay, sorry. Change that instead of um, instead of sts.windows.net. Change that to login.windows.net. This is essentially sort of like using the old Azure V1 stuff. We're going to try that hmm. first because I okay. I see references to it in the docs, which makes me believe that maybe maybe the cognitive services aren't going to work otherwise. So. Okay. Um, okay. That's so that's a good start. So we got an access yeah. token back, which is good. Oh yes. So, uh, and we got our scope. Now, one thing, access. let's go change our, uh, let's go change Autobot our, rolls. let's do a couple, we'll go do a couple things first. Go back to your code and change that scope at the top, uh, our scope const, get rid of the second slash. Suggest so that. And, um, and in fact, get rid of default too, for the moment. We're going to see if we don't need those at all. Okay. And run it again, and let's see if we still get an access token. Uh, okay, so scope's not valid. Okay, cool. So go back. All right, so let's go back um, and put dot default. Let's try just dot default without the second slash. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. We got one. Okay. Still says it's unavailable. So can we copy that whole uh, access token out? You mm -hmm. copy it. We're going to take it over to a website and take a look at what's in it. What well, says permissions denied? Almost feels like yeah, the. I think it's an RBAC question now. I just want to make yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make sure the the token is as we expected. So. Okay. So got token. This is the whole. Yep. You want that thing. whole block. And let's yep. take that over right. to jwt.ms. On the browser. And paste that in there. Okay, so cognitive services .windows or .azure.com, that's cool. Okay, good. So it knows what the app is. That app ID is at 91C. Uh, the mm -hmm. subject ID is 6FFC, which is our, our the app that we gave permissions to. So in Interesting that the issuer is uh, STS, not login. Well, because mm. uh, the STS is the issuer for V1. Login is the authority for V1. That's okay. It doesn't oh. matter. Okay. okay. So go back to, uh, let's go back to Azure, to your uh, item, or to your Cognitive Services account itself. Now, did you update your code to go to 425show.cognitiveservices.whatever? Very, or is it very still going good to be question. Alone? Probably not. Oh, we're there still referencing is. the older one. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Okay. Okay. Maybe that's all it is. Yeah, let's try it. Maybe. Is that the actual domain name? Yeah, it's still working. Still working. That's good. Yeah. That's good. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Oh. I guess we can dun, stop dun, dun. printing your access tokens yeah. all over the internet. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. I'll please make sure out. you delete you delete that. Uh... Yeah. This is the whole resource group is going going bye bye <laughs> after this. No, don't and don't delete app. everything. And the app itself. Get rid of the app too. And the app itself. Yes. Oh yeah. I think everything's okay. in this. Oh yeah. Because this the uh, a. Uh, yeah, because the AAD stuff is not on a resource group at all, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. Okay. In fact, if you're on the Microsoft domain, that's available to everyone. Mm-hmm. So this is hanging forever. Let's just try this one more time. Could it be that something else hang and then it's not just the cognitive services? Yeah, maybe. Recognizing text in OCR. Which is further down. So this call, this happens, and then right after we should print out that. Oh. Okay, so Wonder no more access tokens on the screen, right? Right. Mm hmm. Okay. <laughs> Oh, this doesn't, yeah, this doesn't have the actual API calls. That's common. Did it blow up? 
Or is it just hanging? No, it's just hanging. Oh, that's sad. Could it not? Maybe it's, can it not get to that remote image or whatever anymore? It's possible. Oliver. Let's let's see. Let's just choose a different one. Mm. Okay, that's not gonna work. Oh. Okay. Alicia's doxing herself by putting her resume as a ping on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Does he have contact details as well? I hope not. Mm, yep. Yeah. Hmm. Someone's getting lots of uh, robocalls. Hmm. Still have something else going on. So we know we're getting the token, right? Yep. yep. Um, can you just make the call directly to Cognitive Services? Like just to make without the using the SDK, HTTP call without the SDK to see if that to see if we can, uh, you know, see if there's something else going on. We can try. Um, but, 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 yeah, there's a lot we're gonna have to rebuild here. Hmm. Preparer. So this is the core of it. They do a preparer dot prepare and that returns the HTTP request. Okay, so we can do that. Okay. Okay. So we need Oh, actually, we can use this code. We can just do this. Prepare, dot prepare. Let's do the whole thing. URL parameters are where? Language. Endpoint. Okay, so endpoint is going to be Endpoint is your endpoint, Us. right? Yeah. Oh, now because we use that custom domain, does that have a different endpoint from the one that we used before? Like, yes. Oh. Check the endpoint. I wonder if that's okay. all it is. It's just that. Yes, it could be. Let me check this all in, by the way, real quick. <laughs> yeah, let's get so the can working. Solution in GitHub. Yeah. Okay. So how do I get the new domain? It should be somewhere in here. Ah, four two five stream jam dot cognitive uh, services. Ah, that's what. Uh, that's uh, you know what? That was it. I I it's feel confident. Always, it's always something like that. It's always some brand new slash. detail, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Good reference. I like it. Okay. <laughs> there there it is. Oh, uh, God. We right. did it. See, all we that did it. Always, it just Sold. The wrong URL. Yeah. It's always that. Push, push to production. We're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There you go. It only took us. Uh, I mean, the, the auth was a little bit tricky. It's always DNS. Uh, well. Almost. Well, I mean, this oh, was DNS, go. right? <laughs> yeah, it can, yeah. See, it kind of was. It was DNS. It's and we we also touched on cache caching just a bit. So yes. there was yeah. another one of the big problems in computer science. In there I mean, that technically, we what we wrote uh, twenty lines of code for the auth, all in all. Maybe just less. About. Yeah. Um, you know, our code our, our code production per hour is not very good on this show, Christo. <laughs> Quite low. <laughs> well, are we the paid by the way. line or are we paid by the uh we make it simple for developers i think uh Quantity not i think that's the important too Quantity so not that quality. dev branch that dev branch looks like it's actually going to be a little bit easier to work with mm -hmm. obviously that's there's good. no docs yet well maybe it's because of feedback from people like you yeah yeah so. i actually know a couple of the folks who work on this very SDK. So I'll go chat with them and ask them what their plans are for 
releasing the dev branch to the main branch. And this 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 library is actually looking to be pretty pretty um, nifty. Kind of well, yeah, well put together, but also kind of feels like a de facto standard here. Yeah, it cool. is. It's usually a newing up a new confidential client and then using that client to go and grab the token for you. That's a, that's the standard practice with MSAL across all the languages, mm -hmm. which is it's great. Like it's a convention that you can follow along. So even though I don't know Go, I can come here and I can actually understand what's happening. And on the other side of it, even though I don't know MSAL, I can see this. I'm comfortable with how this looks from the Go perspective. Mm -hmm. And the naming obviously is good enough. So I can say, okay, we're making a credential object and then mm -hmm. we are going and creating a new app or I'm client. Yeah. Yep. And then we're going ahead and putting it all together and getting back a token. And I, I knew it. it before I came into this, I obviously couldn't have gotten anywhere close to any of this without both of you. But before I came into this, I, I at least knew enough to know, okay, we probably are going to be sending this thing up as a bear token because it's a it's a JSON web token. So mm -hmm. send it up as a bear token. I dug around a bit and I could figure out by name that oh, I need to pass up a bear authorizer. I guess I even yeah I even wrote this here. I was like ah it probably will work. Wave my hands a little bit. <laughs> and so that minor. Uh, that that little bit of research plus my vague, vague, vague understanding of how this all works, plus a little bit of code all, when we came into this, plus both of y your guys' expertise. I mean, in fairness, in fairness, if you if you hadn't met us, you wouldn't have had to do any of this at all. So true, <laughs> you would be using the key. <laughs> probably, <laughs> yeah. Well, I probably would have gone with um, managed identity. That would have made this a lot, a lot easier. Uh, uh, in a container on Kubernetes. Container or functions? Would you do, uh, do we have Azure Go? I think it's a, as a preview supported now, right? Yeah, it's a worker. It's a worker. I would have done this in Kubernetes, AKS. Okay. For sure. So a single, a single container uh, running in Kubernetes? Yeah, I, I probably would have done, um, well, if I do this for real, I'll get fancy. But yes, like to start with probably a single container. Okay. So that would be uh, that would be listening to an endpoint where you pass probably a, an image as a URL and then you you run the job uh, and then you return the the text. Well, okay. Here here's the architecture I'm thinking. This okay. is top of my head. Sure. But I told you about Kata at the beginning yes. of this. So Kata lets you spin up or down a container based on. Let's see what it. There's a whole host of Azure services it lets you do right there. Azure container instances, right? So, yes. So, say I have a container running in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. I can get Kata, which also runs in Kubernetes, to spin my container up when something gets pushed up into blob storage. Like right. A, like oh, a Docker. Oh, and your image. Exactly. Or a new doc. Perfect. Exactly. So then uh -huh. my new container spins up. It sees, okay, there's a new thing. Pull it down. Do all the work. Put the text file or whatever into back up into blob storage or somewhere. Cosmos DB more, more likely because then I can mm -hmm. access it and search it. Yeah. And then die because it did its job. Very nice. There you go. So it's a it's an event-driven containerization and then you run the job and you're done. Yep. And Kata is the the tool for this. It's Kubernetes. It stands for Kubernetes Event Driven Applications, and there's so there's almost no machinery to deal with with this. If I were to do this whole system, It'd so que question from an identity perspective: Would I be implementing any authentication on the Kata infrastructure, or or will it still run inside my app like we've done it now? So Kata needs to access Azure Blob APIs. Sure. Which it can do using managed identity. Sweet. So man managed identity gets percolated into Kubernetes containers mm -hmm. with something called pod identity, mm -hmm. which basically is this the app, so Kata itself or my code itself, acts the same exact way as it would if it was on a bare VM in Azure. Right. 
but just for the technical term, Kubernetes does a cross cloud concept called pod identity. Sure. And that's then wired up to manage identity. Mm-hmm. And that way, Kata and my code can both talk to blob storage the same exact way without needing any any other, I think, without needing any other authentication. Connection string. Where is the connection string passed in? There it is. Authentication ref. So you can point this to either that pod identity thing I was talking about or the connection string. Very nice. So what you would do is you would create this pod identity resource, which is mm-hmm. basically a pointer to MSI. You then have this thing point to that pod identity resource. Mm-hmm. And then Kata can talk to blob storage the exact same way as if I write the code and I use mm-hmm. pod identity in my own container. And then you've got no connection strings, which is the dream, right? Yeah. I'm never. asking the auth folks, that's the dream, <laughs> I assume. Yeah, we did a presentation yesterday on exactly that, how mass identity solves a lot of uh, authentication problems and managing secrets. So secretless apps or secretless infrastructure by just using MSI and Azure AD behind the scenes. I love that. And this right here above, this is how you hook your Kubernetes, your AKS, up to the managed identity stuff. Mm-hmm. You just say, this is the this is the Kata way to bridge managed identity into Kata. And you just say, okay, I am running on AKS. So you say pod identity, provider is Azure. And all the Kubernetes AKS goodies that Azure hosts for you, automatically they see this right here and they automatically spring into action and hook up everything you need from MSI and put it into AKS. And with this one thing alone, now all of a sudden Kata can talk without secrets up to Azure Blob and my code can talk up without secrets to Azure Blob and anybody else can too. It's all done for you. I love it. I am loving it too. Because I love it because I don't have to have you both around to walk me through this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah you you all can be freed up to do your work yeah yeah me too sorry. J- yeah, jp I, you're yeah, muted yeah, yeah i'm muted now sorry well i had to eat lunch it was getting cold and i'm hungry so <laughs> i don't want anybody enough. to hear me eating so anyway Thanks for sticking around with us a little bit later today. Yeah. We'll be back next. Uh, we'll be back on Monday. We're going to have a show on Monday, even though it's a holiday. Sadly, we forgot that it was a holiday, so we're still going to have a show. Which it'll be a great show. Just I hate that it's on a holiday, but uh, we'll be back on Monday and Tuesday next week. And uh, in the meantime, join the Discord. Links up at the top of the screen. Uh, we'll make sure we get them into the chat. Uh, send us your questions. Send Aaron any questions you might have on Twitter. Uh, you find us on Twitter, and of course at forty five show at microsoft.com. And we mm-hmm. will uh, we'll be back on Monday. Exactly. Anything else, boys? Before we go, well, I think that's thanks uh, so much for having that's me. Us. Cool. Yeah, thanks for coming. That was super great. We learned Go today, which uh, was great, and we saw how it works with identity. Yeah, we're gonna have to get uh, you back uh, uh, to do like a deep dive on Go for .NET people. Yes. I'm happy to do it. That'd be that'd be great fun. I've actually yeah. I've actually done that teaching before. It's great fun. Yeah, I'd love. Yeah. I, I would love to do that. So, uh, yeah, we'll get it set up. So, all right, cool. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you on the other side. Bye. Are we raiding anyone? I'm like, oh yeah, I guess we should get raid somebody. Who's Clark uh, IO or Instafluff? Well, let's, well, oh, yeah. you know what? I, don't, I didn't have Instafluff. Let's do Clark. Or sorry, okay. let's do Instafluff. Is he up? <laughs> we haven't. We, well, we haven't. Ya. We haven't. We haven't. Uh, we haven't raided Instafluff in a long time. So I feel like we. True. I feel like we should. Yes. Was a good good friend of the show. So yeah, let's go see what uh, Mr. Fluff is up to. And um, it's a great, a great, great name too. It's, uh, it's fun. He's fantastic. fantastic. His show is an absolute circus too. I love it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just it's so unique. So oh, and he's writing some code. Cool. All right, we'll see everybody there. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm-hmm.